It's, yes. it's, it's a big word, isn't it? Woo! It's a big word, freedom. Uh, so I've been thrown in a little bit at the deep end because uh, I've actually just come back from Devon. I didn't expect myself to be here at all. But I did have um, a kind of <coughs> covering some free man and stuff. So I've done a lot of the free man thing myself. So if if any point, I just want to say, if any point you know, something's not clear, just stop and we'll we'll go through it again because it's you know it's very important. We're going to go through. And if you don't, you know, there might be some stuff that you might know, but hopefully we'll just join together some of the dots. So I call this uh, freedom as a state of mind, uh, partly because um, when we look at the state, the state, yeah, actually in a way it is, it is a fictional thing. The state is a fictional thing, yeah, but we give it we give it power because it becomes reality, doesn't it? Once we start to believe in it, and then people, you know, the buildings are actually just buildings, but we fill it with this energy, and then that's that's a kind of the state, isn't it? We call it the state. Actually, uh, there was a guy who, um, does anyone know Mark Thomas of uh, Adventures in Legal Land? Has anyone heard that? Yeah. And um, yeah, quite often he would go into the courts, he would say, you know, um, he would talk about the state, and he'd say, well, where is the state? Is it, is it here in the physical, or is it here there? And they couldn't answer the question, so they, they sort of eventually sort of had to let him go, basically. Or <laughs> let him off his, <laughs> fine. But you can look at Adventures in Legal Land. I'll put some links up at the end as well. So, <clears throat> at the moment, we've got a lot of um, things going on in the world, haven't we? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, there's this Occupy thing going on, isn't it? There's uh, a lot of things, a lot of people unhappy. You know, it's generally, uh, a lot of things wrong with the world today. So, <clears throat> one of the things is actually, from my sort of looking at a lot of this sort of uh, stuff, is a lot of the things that are wrong with the world are actually also wrong with us internally, in a way. And it sounds a bit strange, maybe, to start with. Like, well, what well, but what I'm trying to get at is actually, at the end of the day, is actually to participate in something is one thing. To actually try not to participate in something is still can be a challenge. Now, those people who've tried not to participate in uh, you know, the council tax thing or the other things like that will know how much of a challenge it can be sometimes not to do something. So, actually, a lot of, um, in a way, a lot of the Freeman stuff, some of the most simple stuff, is just not doing it. You know? So, um, by the way, does anyone know what the free man? Has anyone heard that term before? Free man on the land. Free man on the land. Do you know why it's called free hyphen on hyphen no. the hyphen man? It's called, uh, it's like, they call it quantum language. So when you hyphenate language together like that, it becomes a new term that you can apply your own meaning to. So free man on the land was, was a guy called Robert uh, Arthur Menard, of the Menard family. Uh, <coughs> we're going to get into more about families and things like that. But that's why that, that term is actually linked up. So actually, I wanted to sort of think about you know, some of the things that are wrong with the world. Any, any questions? Or any, any ideas? What's wrong with the world? A couple of things. Society. Society. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Society is wrong with the world. Yeah, right. society is over here doing one thing, and the world, the, you know, Mother Earth or whatever you want to call it, is here doing something else, and they're just like clashing up, and we're creating all this pollution and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. What else? Greed. Greed. Yeah, greed. That's it. Yeah. There's all this greed in the world that, you know, so we end up fighting amongst ourselves and all that sort of business, don't we? So, Sin. What's that? Sin. 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 Also known as debt, by the way. Speak of sin. <laughs> when he lives with it, don't. <laughs> yeah, so sin actually uh, translates as debt. Uh, so actually the Lord's Prayer, if you change the word sin and uh, put it into debt, actually, that's an interesting stuff. There's a lot of free man sort of symbole within the, a lot of the, the biblical stuff, especially when you get to the more bank side and everything like that, once you get a little bit more deeper into it. But today we're going to sort of, maybe, we might step into a little bit of banking, because it's an interesting subject, but today I want to talk mainly about the free man issue. But before we do, let's just have a little, uh, little thing. There's things we love in this world, and there's things we hate, okay? And, um, and actually, in a way, you could, I sort of could polarise the world, although it's not exactly polarised, that's why we've got this kind of Vesca Pisces type thing here going on, because it's not exactly polarised. Nothing is 100% good or 100% bad. Like even the society, you can't say it's 100% bad because you know there's some things we quite enjoy about the society, isn't it? So, um, so but there's, it's all right. Let's uh, call my agent. Tell him I'll be uh, I'll be available for the shoot later on in Hollywood next week. But, um, but yeah, there's plenty of things back that are good about the society as well. So one of the things about a lot of the free man stuff is obviously we're you know, coming up against the, some of the rules in society. But I don't think necessarily, from my perspective, anyway. It means that we want to destroy the society. We just want it to work. You know? We just want it to work, that's it. And a lot of people are seeing the failures of the, of the society. And we'll go into a little bit about what the society actually is in a short while. But anyway, there's an interesting sort of thing about love and hate sort of thing. 
like two polarities. So there's there's things there like emotionally that we can sort of feel, but actually everything is kind of mixed up a little bit. So we're going to go. Uh, we're going to start at the basics. What I consider the basics, which is law forms, because actually when you talk about law and freedom, you talk about law. You can't help but sort of bring the two together at some point in the discussion. And one of the things that um, I think is quite fundamental is understanding what law is. Yeah? So law is actually quite an expansive thing. It's uh, you've got all different types of law. So uh, you've got this like uh, the law of the church, illustatical law, or what they call it. Easy, easy classical, is that? Yeah. Ecclesiastical. Yeah. Ecclesiastical. Yeah, there you go. That's my um, prompt. That's why I put it in it. <laughs> right. So and we've got all sorts of other brilliant, brilliant law forms. It's quite an expansive subject for law. I mean, you could spend your whole life just looking at one section of the thing and still not understand it. So we're going to try and do our best tonight. So, so we're just going to take a few of those law forms. And one of the fundamental law forms that I want to talk about is natural law. The reason I want to talk about natural law is because it's actually considered to be uh, the highest of all law forms. Any idea why? Because it's natural. Because it's, well, it's natural. Yeah. <laughs> you can't break it, basically. You cannot break natural law. It's like gravity. You know, if I jump, I'm uh, coming back down. And that's, uh, that's natural law. You know, well, we might be able to develop some sort of anti-gravity device. But for now, me jumping up and down, everyone understands that, right? Yeah? Okay, so, so natural law is basically, I want you to imagine... If you were on your own on a desert island, okay, and you had to survive, that is nat you'd be living under natural law. There would be no government or anything like that. You'd be on your own, making the best of it, right? Okay, so that's natural law. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is get into this, con this concept now of contractual law. So what happened was, you know, there I was on my desert island, and then someone comes into my space, and all of a sudden now I've got a, this other thing. I've got this other thing to deal with. It's like it's similar to me. It has similar needs to me. But actually, I've been growing my coconuts out the back here. And what I really want to do is I really want to keep those coconuts for myself because I've planned it for the future. That's going to be all the coconuts I need. So I have to come to an agreement. Okay, rather than you know do the, steal my coconuts or whatever, why don't you grow some coconuts over there? You see. So actually, now we're, we're, we've we've come to this agreement. It's a contract. You see, because before we were infinite, I could have had any coconut I wanted. But now, I'm down to my like. My, the ones that I need, because I recognise there's somebody else who needs a coconut too. So, basically, there's a, there's a saying here called, truth is king in commerce. Okay, so, one of the things in the Freeman movement, as if, you, if you think of it like that, a, a section of that would be commercial law, okay? And that would be operating in this, in this thing, the law of contracts. And actually, if you can understand the law of contracts, you can do quite a lot, quite a lot. And we'll talk about some uh, handy little techniques in a second bit. So let's just move on to the next one. So moral law. So after a while, you know, certain things are going in certain ways, and you know, we we had a little bit of a kerfuffle along the way. Some people died, even it was terrible. And then what happened was they said, okay, well we've got this kind of moral understanding now about how that makes us feel when you know you come here and you, you kill all these people here, and then we go back and do the same to you. So instead of all that, let's let's produce this morality thing. And we gradually developed all that, and then uh, you know maybe some guy went up the mountain and came back with some tablets. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But uh, that was generally the idea, right? Is that okay? We're not going to kill each other anymore. Okay, right. Uh, well, in fact, they sort of just said, well, let's just co let's call it. That. Well, actually, what they did was then they codified it. Well, they kind of codified it. They did it through. Let me just say this. In a way, a contract is not just a written agreement. It's actually an act as well. So how you are acting is how we are contracting. So. For example, there was a part in English history, about 12, uh, 1215, uh, called it the Magna Carta. And basically, the, just to cut a long story short, the king was being a bit terrible to the people. And so they got them all together at Runnymede and they just said, you know, let's have this, uh, let's have this agreement. So there was what was known as the three estates of England were there. there the king, all the bishops, and the common people represented by the barons. And so in a way, that sort of, the, the thing that was laid out there was really just to establish the, the, the rights of the people. It really is like quite simple. You, know? you have the right to life, liberty, and property. It's not complicated. It's, it's all you really need, really, isn't it? You have a right to something rather than a, a denial of something. So Magna Carta 1215, you can look at some of that. And if you, um, if you go, get into this Freeman movement at all, if, um, if you start to look into it, you'll, you'll probably start to find is people like John Harris, that my name might pop up, who's done something with the Magna Carta 1215, a, a simple affidavit. Because under uh, Clause 61, 
you can actually uh, you know, petition the Crown and say, I'm not very happy with the way that society is going and uh, I therefore enter into a lawful rebellion. Sort of thing. And what's supposed to happen is they say, OK, yeah, it's fine, and um, you know, no problem. Uh, we'll, we'll mark that on your record and we won't hassle you ever again. <laughs> now, it doesn't quite work like that, but that's what's supposed to happen. <laughs> still, I still recommend doing it because it's a, it's a statement, really, isn't it? And actually, half of what we're going to talk about when we talk about freedom as a state of mind it's actually about how you're feeling inside about all this stuff, you know. It's about feeling comfortable. So, you know, if that helps you develop your own kind of sense of freedom, because I've, t I've taken this act, and you can, you can demonstrate that you've taken this act, it says something more about you, because it's not necessarily about the paper that's written, it's about your intention. Okay? Right. Well, let's go for the last one here. Statute law. All right, I'm going to put this at the bottom here, because actually, believe it or not, actually, statute law does come under all of these, because it... In, it, in a way, it came later on. It wasn't until they formed the Parliament that they actually made up a, a kind of idea of codifying these laws in a book. Um, the, this Parliament basically would run the, run the country on behalf of the uh, Queen or King, who was supposed to be sovereign, which means actually they're looking after the thing for us. Yeah. Uh, and then they've made this secondary body they call the government. And that, those, those people sort of pass the laws that we call, well, the things that we normally call law today, basically. But the point is, it's actually it's all derived supposedly from the common law. But they're actually called legislative rules of a society. Okay. So, any questions about law forms? Are we quite... No? All on point there? Just technically, because King John was a real tyrant, you know, yeah. from what I understand from the history. And what technically did... I guess you could say it was signed under duress, no? Okay, yeah. And well, let's. He does that okay. Magna Carta, but mm. Magna Carta predates Parliament as well. So. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, let's say this. Uh, yeah, because in fact, in a way, he did say that because straight after that, in uh, 1296, he actually made a, a statutory version. That's one of the first statutes, right? Um, so when he made that statute, he actually changed the language and turned the thing around quite, quite considerably. And uh, one of the things he did actually was change. Uh, I think it's Article 40 or something like that. Uh, originally, in, in the original uh, Magna Carta that was the common law version, 1215, it says, you know, you, you can be a free man, and, and you notice it's not capital F. Okay? That's quite an interesting point, because once you put a capital on something, it becomes a title. Do you want a quick aside? Okay, I'll go for a quick aside. So basically, I was looking on the internet about Freeman, yeah? and all of a sudden, I, I suddenly came across this role of Freeman. Okay, in uh, Bristol City Council, they hold the <laughs> role of Freeman. Well, that sounds interesting. And now, looking through the, uh, and the way I found it was, I was looking at the, uh, the the council tax thing. I was looking at the, uh, they've got like some legislation, 1976, to do with, you know, how how they can build you council tax and things like that. And it actually says in there, if you're a free man on the role of Freeman, you don't have to pay council tax. You've been given the key to the city. So I thought, oh, brilliant! So all you have to do is actually get yourself on that role. But actually, then what I worked out after that was that was applying to the statute because they're all statute laws, right? So they only operate within themselves, really. So actually, what they're, what they're really going on about there is actually you can be a freeman as in uh, there is a, they've actually made a title of the thing. And we're going to what titles are because that's really what tonight is about. It's about title. Yeah? Because what is, what is an artificial person? It's a title. We're getting to that anyway. But, but just to say, yeah, there is a role of freeman. You can check it out on the internet. And uh, actually, if you do some amazing, amazingly fine deeds for Bristol City Council, they may award you the uh, key to the city, and then you won't have to pay council tax. But actually, it's a diplomatic role, basically. Uh, any other questions about, um, or comments? Because that was a good comment. Yeah. It, it, legal fiction, yeah? Birth certificate? Yeah, we're going to get into all the birth, birth certificate stuff. I'll go, I can go through a little bit more detail yeah, about how all that works. If you want to go into birth certificates, we can do that. Yeah. Can they legally threaten you if you've made an offer to pay a small amount of money, council tax? Okay, can I legally threaten you? Okay, can the council legally threaten you if you... Do you want, do you want to deal with council tax? Yes. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. How to get off? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, can I answer that in about half an hour? Yeah, or at yeah. the end is fine. Yeah, because yeah, actually I will. I will go through council tax. We can go through that, yeah. Okay, well, and how that all works. Because I've got a whole bit on Bristol City Council, which I think I'll fit in quite nicely. Yes. So let's just go back a little second to this uh, reality versus fiction. Okay. So actually, you know, this is real. I, I can, things I can touch are real, right? Yeah. Yeah, the pen is real. Yeah, sorry, go. Are you going to put this uh, on, you know, can we access this um, on the internet? 
Well, I hope so. Look, we've got, uh, we've got a guy filming it here, so uh, hopefully uh, something will come out of it. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, actually, just a quick plug. Tomorrow night at, uh, on Sky Channel 201, we've got Guy Taylor, who's a freeman on the land, who's just liquidated, well, just really been fighting his council tax, and he's got a huge property, the manor and everything like that, oh. which if you get into the freeman movement, you'll probably find out about these places. Um, but yeah, he's actually speaking on Sky Television. We've done an interview with him. So he does cover a lot of what he's been doing in the courts in that interview. So, yeah, so. Can we get this presentation from somewhere? Yeah, yeah um, I'll tell you what. Also, you can, uh, the slides will be in the video. Yeah. Slides will be in the video, and if, if you really want it, just, just come and I'll give you a card and I'll email to you. No yeah. problem. Yeah, so. Well, you yeah, can call us later, we'll sort it out. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, real fiction, real, real. Oh, yeah, what's real? Oh, the pen was real. Yeah, we're all real, okay? Uh, as real as we can be sure that we're real, if that makes any sense, yeah? Because actually, it might all be a dream, okay? But let's just assume that it's not for a second. That we are actually real, okay? <laughs> okay, but what we can say is that we do have a dream state. Because actually, we go to sleep and we have this dream state. And that's very in an interesting part of the fiction because it's imaginary. It's imaginary. And imagination is actually very powerful. How do I know that imagina imagination is very powerful? Because without imagination, that table would not actually exist. It would still be a piece of wood. It would be growing in the tree. Okay, so it would still be growing in the woods if, if we hadn't come down and done something. And to do something to something, you've got to have an idea about what you want to do to it. So actually, the idea of imagination is very powerful. But it's still in the world of fiction, pre-manifestation. Yeah, everyone agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we're going to go down here. So we've got this, on the one side we've got these things, human beings. Any human beings in the house? Good, yes. Any robots? <laughs> Aliens? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> and then we've got these corporations. Corporations, the dead, dreaded C word. Uh, corporations, the corpse. Yeah, yeah. But on the one hand, we've got this idea of community, isn't it? And for me, that kind of talks, wonders, and sort of like, yeah, we're all working together, tra trading, helping each other out. That's real for me because it's direct contact, yeah. Whereas they've got this idea of government, yeah, which actually passes legislation and tries to. To you know, tell you what to do and everything like that, but not saying it's all sometimes not bad. I mean, you know, it's not all bad because, uh, as I said before, nothing's 100% good or bad. But you know, sometimes they might. It's a bit more difficult, isn't it? If you're standing afar, it's a bit more difficult to get involved with your hands in the dirt. Do you know what I mean? It's like one group of people, another group of people. What do they all want? You know, and we're putting all our hopes in one guy right at the top to sort out all those different opinions. Anyway, that's my idea of the sort of government thing. It's the thing that floats across. Imaginary, but we put our faith into it. So then we have the like natural land and the goods. So these are goods, these are properties, these are services. Yeah, the, 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 sorry, the goods are real, you know, tangible things. Yeah. And the other thing is like countries and nations, which is where, you know, we've got this idea of countries. But really, if you were an alien being coming down and looking at the planet for the first time, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know what was England, what was Italy, what was. You would just see land and you'd see the sea, and that would be it. So that's all fiction, but it has a very, very powerful effect because in all cultures and everything like that. Your whole identity. You know, where do you come from? I'm, I'm English, I'm whatever. Yeah? So, very, very powerful, this fiction. It creates a, a reality. So that's <laughs> an interesting thought, is that the reality, in a way, comes first. Now, is that a bit too deep? No, no, no. no. Are we all there with that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the spiritual tip. Brilliant. Okay, so let's move on a little bit. So, yes. you've got people like this guy. Yeah, all right. <laughs> who, who saw the uh, drama? The assassination drama? <laughs> No? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so many things are kind of uh, quite laughable about the character, you know, in a kind of dark kind of way, really. I mean, you think about the, the, the terrible things that manifested because of this one man, and yet here, we, here he is, sort of, you know, the, sort of, they're using him, and, and every moment, like another little story or something like that, just to, just to get us emotionally rivaled up. And uh, here he is, like, in this little role. <laughs> so basically, appearing you know what I mean? on the television uh, in this fictional story, basically. <laughs> that actually, in the end, becomes this kind of terrible reality, this terrible problem. And then we get this guy to come in and <laughs> solve the day. And, and it's just, you know, I, I always thought that I saw that and I was like, what? It sounds a bit like a Iraqi bomber. <laughs> but I, I couldn't work it out how people could actually uh, you know, go for it. But there you go. I mean, for me, it just seemed a bit all too fictional. But, but people did, they believed it, and they were all in the, all in the place. So it was cheery, weren't they? Oh, they're America, thank God. <laughs> thank God we got rid of Bush. I quite like George Bush, actually, I must oh, say. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, at least, at least with George, you could, you could take the piss, couldn't you? you could, <laughs> yeah, there's something to laugh about. You know, more difficult with these guys, they're not very funny, are they? <laughs> more difficult. 
Yeah, so if we're taking the if we're taking the Mickey, at least you know we can uh, we can we can do something with it. But anyway, out of these, just a quick question: which one is based in reality? Natural. 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 It's all going in. I'm glad it's all going in. So I'm making this very, very simple at the moment, right? So natural law is the only thing that's real, okay? So actually, if you think about even this concept of money and all this depression and all that sort of stuff, actually, it's not real. What's real is our relationships. So I think that's actually, you know, one step beyond the free man movement is actually, okay, now we've got there and we're free. Now we need to work together again, okay? So, so we're, always, we're always contracting. Okay, what I'll do is we'll do a little bit of money and banking, just... I'll do it quite quickly, yeah, just because it is quite topical. Yeah. Um, so, who here likes the banks? Oh, it's only me. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. <laughs> okay, look. They've got a bit of a bad rep. rep, rep yeah? They've got a bit of a bad rep. Okay, yeah? well, let's, let's look at it from the bank's perspective. Yeah? Here they are. They're just trying to get this whole thing called civilization going. And they're wondering about how the hell they're going to do it. Yeah? The thing keeps going bankrupt all the time, right? There is a reason for that, but they haven't worked it out yet. But, but it's not really their fault, but what they did was they, they let's say this is our desert island, you know? remember our desert islands and the natural law, right, okay. So here they were, and they said, well, you know, we're going to have to develop some sort of system, okay, so let's develop a system where we can, uh, well, what they said was originally, let's have the gold, yeah, so they said the gold, and they looked after the gold, and they gave gold receipts, and that gold receipts then started to be traded, so, so this is uh, one of the things, and they noticed, oh, well, so we can lend at interest. Now, let me just talk about, before that, we didn't have interest, we had something else, called tithing. But they developed something called interest, which is actually called usury. It's, a, it's illegal. It's illegal under, under biblical law, because you can't, you can't make money out of nothing, basically. But that's what they've been doing. So if, they all had, if everyone here had £10 each, let's say, and this guy at the top, number one, he decides he's going to lend <coughs> £1 to everybody, an interest rate, eventually what will happen is he'll start to collect the interest, which means he starts to get his money back. Now he's got his money back. Now he starts to move into the next phase, which is now he starts to make money. Now the thing is, as he makes money, everybody else's money, because they're paying interest into that one, uh, one entity, what starts happening, he starts to grow. He starts to take over everything. He starts to own everything. So what happened was with the, the society is that once they started to charge interest, uh, then it sort of, the thing started to disappear. You know, we started to lose the land. We started to lose the, the government. We started to lose control, basically. Um, so it's no longer about people anymore because eventually what happens is is that they take over everything, and that's kind of been the plan from from a certain perspective. Is actually they want to just have everyone in this financial debt, you know, and the way to do it is to, to create the, the the currency and then charge interest on it. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, they actually have another form of interest called compound interest, which means that actually every year that you don't pay it back, they add a little bit more interest based on the amount that you borrowed. And they start to accumulate this up. So you can actually see here the, where the blue is. That would be if it was just normal interest at a certain amount. And then this, would, this curvature here, this exponential curve, goes up and up and up. Is what they call compound interest. So now, now not only are they making interest, they're making more of it more quickly. So now they're, they're, the, the thing is growing even more, more quickly. So actually it doesn't take anyone too long to work out that's why we're in this situation right now. Because you can't you know, carry on like that and expect the whole system to work. Okay, so compound interest means that they start to take a lot more than their share. Now, what happened was it went really, really bad, and basically they built up this whole thing they call civilization, and that involved a lot of people shipping stuff out across the seas and things like that, because it involved all this commercial um, endeavors, you know, exploring, expansion. It required a lot of money and funds to do that. Now we didn't actually have enough money to do it, so he said, "What we'll do is, we'll we'll we'll, we'll fudge it." That's basically what they said. We're going to make out that we've got something. So we're going to make out this new law where if we've got, like, uh, say, let's say we had a, a 10 gold coins, then actually we could lend out 100, okay? And then basically that would, they would, that would then be deposited, and then they could lend out, you know, uh, a, a, another amount. So basically 10% reserve would be 10 units, so you could deposit 100, yeah? You keep 10 on, yeah? Then that's all lent out, then you get 90 units. So actually, once that's deposited back, you get 10%, so that's another nine units. So you get the idea, nine gold coins. So actually, once this stuff has gone round and round and round, you get something that looks a little bit like this. So this is, uh, these are your reserve requirements. How much do you actually need to keep hold of? Once someone makes a deposit, one deposit into the bank, how much do you need to keep hold of in order to, and how much can you lend out again? So actually, what they're doing is they're cycling this money through which is essentially a closed-loop system because it's a centralised banking system, right? 
So all the banks are connected by one bank, Bank of England, which is connected to another bank called the World Bank, uh, IMF, or whatever you want to call it. And really what that does is that that, that's it, that money never leaves the system, it's just being created. So question, where does 98% of the money that's created in the society come from? Debt. Debt, like that one? Thin air, like that one? What place though? Where's the physical place where it's created? Hmm? <laughs> Sorry? Digital. Digital? Yeah, 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 yeah. All these methods, but where is the place where it's actually created? What's the name of it? Future. No, no, not yet. Yeah. Okay. What I was getting at is it's actually in the High Street Bank. It's not in the it's not in the back end or anything. It's actually in the bank high street bank. So that's where ninety eight percent of the cash is actually made. Because that's where you go and deposit your money. Yeah? That's where you go and sign up for your credit cards, sign up for your mortgages. And all those things, 98% of the money that's in supply today is created inside those institutions right on your doorstep. Who's got a credit union account? No, but I'm thinking yeah. about it. Oh, I about reckon you should go for it. I mean, there are great people down there. I'm going to give them a big plug. Credit union, great people. They are bankrolled by high street finance. They are bankrolled by the cooperative, yes, that's right. <coughs> but actually, in a way, it's, it's quite a nice com kind of compromise, I think, between sort of getting... Because you've got the cooperative bank, but then it's one step away because it's local investment, so... Yeah, it's not too bad. Plus, it's a board of yeah. You go in there and you just get a nice, quite, quite a nice feeling, don't you? So, yeah, they're all quite relaxed. Okay, anyway. profit making. The, co um, yeah. the credit union. Yeah. Sorry, Dan. Are they profit making? For the credit unions. Yeah. Well, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, they must make a profit somewhere because they right. need to. Exactly. They need to. Uh, yeah, obviously, run with the staff and everything like that. But actually, think about it. It's not too bad an idea because they're providing. The way I see it is they provide a service. So that's why I say I'm not anti-bank, I just think they should do the service up, really. I mean, it's crap, isn't it? I mean, we, we pay all these charges, we pay all that stuff, but we give them loads of money and they didn't give us anything back. So it just seems a little bit one-sided, doesn't it? So it's not, I'm not, that's why I'm saying I'm not anti-bank, I'm just anti the way that it's, it's structured at the moment, because I think it could be fairer, you know. And actually, it, it would work in their benefit too, if it was, because... Well, they need to stop losing money at that, what, 10 times what they've got, well, didn't they? Well, there is that, yeah. That does credit you then? Yeah, it does. It lends, but I say the thing about the credit union is it stays quite local. Well, it does stay local. It stays, which I think is an important part of actually building up your, your your monetary circulation. The thing about money, right, is that you've got a bank here and you've got a bank here and you've got a river that flows in between, and that is it's the currency that makes the value. Okay, so as it goes from one part to the other, that's what makes the value. If it's just sat in, on the bank, stagnant pool of water, nothing happens. You need two banks and you need things to flow. So actually, if you think about it, whenever it flows, that's creation. We're, cr we're supposed to be creating at that point. I'm, s I'm creating into society, into the society. So if, if, if they adopted that kind of mentality in, in order to enable people to create, then yeah, fair enough. But it's when they start to charge loads, interest, blah, 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 that it doesn't really work. Anyway, I've got, I've got plenty of ideas of how we could run the banking industry, but we won't go there, because I say we're going to skip over it. But one of the key things I want you to remember is that you can't tax the principal. And this is very important because, and I'll tell you this, we've written to, who, who's in debt by the way? Yeah? Okay, cool. <laughs> right, I'm just going to say, no, no one is in debt. Oh, yeah, yeah. No one's in debt. Yeah. There you go, that's it, that's the news. No one's in debt, yeah. Uh, the signature. Yeah, 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 that's it. No one's in debt, and actually we, uh, I know people who've written to the Treasury, and they've asked them, how many human beings in the UK are you willing to state on the record are in debt? And they said, none of them are. Because actually, there's one thing about human beings that are quite cool is that they can't get into debt. That's why the Lord forgave us our sins, is it worth it? <laughs> all our debts. So we're all forgiven. So one of the things is, that's why it says you can't tax the principal. And what I mean by that is if you tax the principal, you'll be destroyed. So if you have like a basket of 10 apples, right? And you start to take, and you, let's, oh, let's, let's, say, let's say you have an apple tree. That's a good example, because it reproduces, doesn't it? Yeah? And let's say each year it produces 100 apples, yeah? Now, if basically, if you take, um, you know, 10 apples off that, maybe that's enough, because then I've got 90, yeah, I'll give 10 away, brilliant. Yeah. But if they start to take all, like, the majority of the apples, yeah, then actually, it's, no, it's not enough, I've got to go and do other things, yeah. If they take all the apples, and that's still not enough, and now they start hacking you down the branches of the tree just to try and get more apples, you actually start to destroy the thing that actually allows you to create the thing. So that's what the principle is. That's what it means by the principle. So actually, the interesting thing is that in the society... You are the principal. You are the principal. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail on why that is. But let's just have a quick look at what I meant by tithing. 
ten percent tithing. So you've got the shepherd dude here. He's got a hundred sheep. Yeah. Now he has a really good year, and the sheep are all going for it. And so he breeds another fifty sheep. Okay. So he was, it's an ethical shepherd, by the way. Okay? <laughs> Looks after his sheep very nicely. Combs them. Like all right. So, so basically, and they don't, they don't go for meat, by the way. They're just, just there for pets. All right, okay. That's just to please all the vegans of the audience. Okay. So now, what we've got is here, we've got, we've got 150 okay, sheep. Yeah. So how, what would be the tithing if the tithing was 10%? Five. That's it. You've got it. It'd be five. Because actually, you, didn't, you, didn't wanna, you wouldn't want to actually tax the principal, but just buy it, yeah? If it was, um, if it was taxing the, the whole thing, it would be 15, wouldn't it? Obviously, at the moment, we're, I don't know how much tax we're actually paying once you add it all up, because there's hidden taxes, inflation, all the other stuff. I've heard people say it's as much as uh, like 80 pence in the pound, 80% of your money is actually taxed. So whether it's you're buying a beer or whatever, you know, or whether it's other taxes, like little things they slip in there you wouldn't even know about. But about 80%, they reckon, of the money that you earn is a tax. So if, if you think about that, if it was 80%, then basically the guy wouldn't have enough, wouldn't have enough sheep to, to breed for next year, basically. So that's taxing the principal. So now you've got a kind of background as to why I think it's important, you know, not not to allow them to destroy what we have. Yeah. So any questions on any of that? No. All quite clear. Yeah. God, we're a bright bunch, aren't we? <laughs> okay. So um, <laughs> there we go. The original hundred remains intact. Very important. So money creation. We're just going to a little bit about that. I said at ninety-eight percent is created in the High Street Bank. And what I want to do is I want to explain how, and then we're going to go into the, the, the nuts and bolts about this legal fiction business. So money creation is an interesting process because it, it, the first time you sort of, you're involved in different levels at the same time. That's why it gets a little bit confusing because what you think you're doing, you're probably not doing. So it starts up here, human being, yeah? There's a natural person, they're called a natural person in law. Uh, and then we come around here and then there's, they create, they have the power of the pen. The pen is mightier than the sword, and what they do is they carve out a signature and a bottom or something. It can be a cross. That's all you need. And it doesn't even need to have anything on the piece of paper, by the way. It can be blank. That creates, that's a signature, yeah? Actually, uh, just a little aside, if you go into Black's Law, what it actually says is that a signature, or is it, no, an endorsement. An endorsement is like a, a signature that can be associated with magical symbols. So I always thought that's quite, to see that in a law dictionary, the word magical symbols next to a signature, <laughs> yeah, gives you kind of like an impression as to like, what is this thing? Yeah? Mm -hmm. It is in a way, it's a magical symbol because it, what, it, what it shows is evidence of commercial energy, it shows evidence of life, it shows evidence of potential because it's the only thing that can do it as a human being, right? So it's a very, very, very special thing. Now what they've done is, to make it a little bit easier for us, They've actually got us these, these PIN, P-I-N numbers. Yeah. So now you don't even need to sign with a pen. In case you, you, know, in case you can't find your pen now, you just like, type in a number and press enter. And that's just as good. That'll do. That'll do. Only a human being can do that as well. So, so there you go. Human beings have signatures. It's one thing that sets them apart from corporations. Right. So these things are called negotiable instruments. And you can look up the law on negotiable instruments. I can't remember what year it is now. But it's actually one of the only statute laws that has notaries in. And we can talk a little bit about notaries and their power in a bit. But negotiable instruments are pieces of money. So what, what, maybe we can have a talk about where it all comes from in just a sec. But basically, all it is is a signature on a piece of blank paper. It doesn't need anything, because then, then the person, another person can fill it out, make a drawer, and all this sort of stuff. So this is, um, goes in there. So once I've got this negotiable instrument, this could be, by the way, a credit card. It could be a mortgage agreement. It could be anything that you've signed, actually, ever in the bank. Right? Anything that you signed is a negotiable instrument. How many people have signed pieces of paper in the bank? I don't. Yeah, exactly. So who hasn't? No one. We've all done it. Yeah, that's it. So anyway, what happens is, let's imagine, I'll give you a real example now. So I'm, I'm uh, here in the bank, and I've got these credit cards, okay? And what I want to do is I want to sell the credit cards and get negotiable instruments back. And once I've got 1,000 negotiable instruments, all for 1,000 pound credit cards, and I know that that's going to pay back X amount per month or per year or whatever it is, I can bundle them all up and sell them as a larger package to an investor and then I get the money up front. Now you guys are all paying it back, aren't you, to me but I'm passing it on to somebody else now. So I've actually made, yeah, they actually make their money up front. So that's the new money is lent yeah, to a person. 
So we're going to talk about this next person is this artificial creation. We're going to talk about where it comes from and that. But it actually, it's, it sounds like you, but it's not. Okay? It sounds, it sounds exactly like you, but it's not. It sounds, and the, the reason, uh, I can explain a little bit in a sec why we've got this person situation. So basically every human being has a person. You're not, you're not a person, you have a person. It's your own little vehicle. You can steer it around the commercial world and you can get it to do things. But only you have the power to sign for it, you see? Okay? So that's kind of what, what, what it's like. Okay, so artificial person. That's the thing that's getting into debt. That's why I said none of you guys are in debt. It's only your artificial person. Because that's the thing. You can do whatever you like to it. You, know? you can do all sorts of things. Because it's it. Now, human being is responsible. You're enough responsible now for paying back. And if you don't pay back, you're a very naughty boy. And we shall put you in a, hu in a hole somewhere. <laughs> or do something else. Until you agree that you're going to pay back. And then we shall sort out a payment plan of at least one pound a week. And then we shall make sure that you pay that back for the rest of your life. And that's the way it works. Go back to the human being. So that's the circle of money. So out of that, um, which part of that is the real thing? The human being. The human being. So let's have a look. It sort of breaks up like this, isn't it? We've got this human being, we've got the bank, and we've got the person. Okay? So that's how it goes. That's a, that's a cycle. Okay? And then, you're right, you cannot tax the principal. So actually, although you're responsible to pay, nobody said how. <laughs> how are you going to pay? Right. <clears throat> Okay, let's go into a little bit about this picture. That's the banking section over. Sorry about that. Very boring banking. It's very, very boring money, isn't it? It's interesting, actually. All these things that were taught about at school, I just thought, you know, how to do this and how to read and how to do maths and everything like that. And they never told you about how the monetary system works. <laughs> and yet, I mean, if you look at domestic arguments and all this sort of stuff, and it's all about money, right? Amazing, and yet we never ever talked about how it works. <laughs> now, for those who want to know a little bit more, there's we're actually uh, this money is debt three now. We're actually uh, going to be putting that out on uh, Paradigm Shift Television quite soon. Uh, and if you can't wait for that, then uh, either one and two are available. So I think we've got it on for sale. So that's another plug there. And we'll okay. give a talk here next year, probably to start for Christmas. Yes, that's it. Yeah, we'll get the get the money guys in. Yeah. So they'll be able to go a lot more into detail. But any questions about money? I did a good job then, did I? Because it's quite a hard subject, really, isn't it, to keep it entertained? Come on, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so here we go. What is a person? So these are these are quotes from uh, a book called Black's Law. So let me just quickly explain. Black's Law is a is a law dictionary, and it's supposed to be the uh, the, the dictionary you refer to. So there's a language called legalese. It sounds like English, but it's got slightly different definitions. So when someone says something to you in legalese, they're saying something quite different to what you might think. Often. <laughs> um, I'll give you an example. Understand. Yes. No, it's okay, Never. No? Okay, right. So people like this. Understand. Yeah, so under I'm understanding your authority, yes. Actually, uh, as a, a sort of Funny thing, my, I had a friend, he's a Jamaican friend, and, and he was saying actually out in Jamaica where they have this thing called overstand. Yeah. yeah. Has anyone heard that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't understand. I overstand. <laughs> I thought that's quite, that's, they, they kind of worked it out well, well before I did. Anyway. Um, so actually, words are very powerful, and you, we, can, we can talk about some of the interesting words that are used in the, in the game. It's a game, really. It's a game. So basically, uh, here, I've just got these definitions here. One's from the first edition of Blacks. Notice what they do is, as the editions, you might notice, as it goes through, they try and hide things more and more. So, for example, uh, they put all the legal maxims now. They've, they've hidden them at the back in some illo illogical order, so you can never find the thing that you want, yeah? rather than being in an obvious place. But anyway, uh, so persons are divided into more into natural and artificial. Natural persons are, are as such as the god of nature formed us. That's the, that's the guy up there, or whoever it was that this whole thing's based on. So basically, that's the, rea that's the real stuff, natural law. Okay? Artificial as such, as are created and devised by human laws for the purpose of society and governments, which are called corporations or bodies politic. Now what's interesting there is that actually what it's saying is that persons are corporations. 
That's the first definition of it. I mean, it went back uh, yeah, all this time. When was it? Um, I can't remember the date now. That's been a long time since I looked. But anyway, it's a long time ago. Yeah. So actually, even then, when we had this definition, the corporations and everything like that was well known to, we were, that we had one. Yeah, it was well established within the legal world. So natural persons are such as formed by nature as distinguished from artificial persons or corporations. So actually, what I'm pointing out there is that there is a difference. It's not just you know, making up. There is actually, even in the law dictionary, a very distinct difference. So artificial person acts an entity uh, such as a corporation, such as a corporation, yeah. created by law and given certain legal rights and duties of a human being. Let me just explain. A person doesn't have any rights, really. It has duties, okay, more than it has rights. Okay, so duties trump rights in all cases, apart from three rights, which is natural, unalienable, uh, uh, human rights, as defined by those rights. Those, those rights there belong to the realm of human beings. Every other right that they come up with is all to do with artificial persons. An artificial person is the only one that they have. Is mainly what they have is a duty. So let me explain. Because, let's say someone set up this thing, okay, this society, yeah, then that person that operates within that society is in, the, is in a corporation, as a member of that society, and they have a duty. They have a duty to that society to abide by all the laws. Yeah? And that is, the thing about duty is also what you pay, isn't it? So I'm going to say this, actually all the laws are duties and duties are things you pay. That's why you have to pay every time you've go, got a speeding ticket. Or it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. I mean, I know plenty of people have been into the courts like completely, no, no, you've got it completely wrong. I wasn't, it wasn't me, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> they still go there. Well, is that your car? Uh, yes, it was registered. Oh, bang, bang there's the bill. <laughs> it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Because they're not, they're not, oh, but yeah, my mum was sick and blah, blah, blah. It's nothing to do with that. It's nothing to do with morality. It's to do with finance. That's all it is. It's a financial deal. That's all you do. We're in the society, and the society needs payment. And how are we going to pay for it? We'll make some laws. That's what they do. So when I say certain legal rights, yeah, certain, when you look at it in, in Black's Law, actually means one way dictated. So from them down to you, your person, should I say. Yeah. That's a certain legal right. Yeah. So that's what, what makes it certain and not vague because they write it all in a book. But the only thing is, it's like, you know, even the police can't be bothered to read. So if they don't know the law, who does? I don't think even the laws know the law. Anyway, it's too much of it. Anyway, I did write, when I first started to get into all this Freeman stuff, I was like, wow, this is fantastic. Oh, right, I could see a whole new perspective because I was in quite a dark space. As we said, I was in a bit of a dark space. You know, I'd been sort of hammering away at the 9-11 issue seeing the, the, this thing called the New World Order rise up before me. Anyone heard of that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, good. Uh, yeah, the ID cards, all this, oh my God, <laughs> nightmare, terrible. And then I, all of a sudden I saw this, I was like, wow, this is, this is great, because actually, this is what I, this is like, you know, you just thought you got to the top and then you, you learn a little bit more, don't you? And it keeps going like that, doesn't it? You think you get there and then wow, another thing opens up. And this is a big chapter. So one of the things that I did was, uh, in about, what was it, 2000 and, Nine, eight, I can't remember now. But anyway, somewhere, somewhere about three years ago, wherever we are now. I sort of decided, me and my friend, we went on this thing, we called it Operation, uh, Operation Clarification and Project Oath. And what we did was we, uh, we wrote quite a few letters, and we just started banging out all these letters. And this is one of the ones we wrote to the, we wrote to the Ministry of Justice, because we were trying to find out where it was in the statutes that we find the definition of a person. So here they wrote back to me, and they said basically it's in Schedule 1 the Interpretations Act 1978. Okay. And let's just lay it up a little bit so you can see. Now. So an act of, uh, yeah, whether you use an act of parliament or in a statutory uh, instrument includes a body of persons, corporate or unincorporated. One thing I'd just like to point out is that after that they wrote something quite interesting. Let's take it back. It says, the effect is that a reference to a person will cover both a natural person, an individual, and a legal person. So they make the distinction, yeah? Then I started to look at what in effect meant, yeah? And then I, then I started to look at what um, is that the reference to a person will cover, yeah? Now, an effect is something that, which happens as, as a cause of something else, yeah? So that meant there was a cause to it, yeah? Now, cover is quite an interesting term because actually what it, there's one of the things it actually means which is an insurance policy. <laughs> okay. Anyone got any national insurance? 
Okay, right, yeah. So, what, let me just tell you, in a way, this is very, very integral to what this artificial person is, this national insurance. It's an insurance policy, yeah, to cover your operation as a human being within this corporate fiction, and they're scared because you are so powerful that you could destroy it. And that's true. If you found out the truth about how all this, if everyone on mass works it all out, you are so powerful you could just destroy it, you could have them all hung for trees, and you could do all sorts, all this sorts of stuff. They're so powerful. That's how powerful human beings are. But they have to go, they have to put an insurance policy on you <laughs> to ensure that you don't do anything. So, <laughs> that's a bit bizarre, that? that's kind of ridiculous. So anyway, so cover both. Yeah, it covers both. So you're covered there. National insurance. <laughs> so um, I'll just go forward there. So here we go. Yeah. So I just actually went to the uh, the act itself, and here it says uh, the definition of a person so far. Right. Uh, as it is includes includes uh, bodies corporate applies to any provision of an act. So it's any act in Parliament. Now an act is exactly what it is. It's an act. Okay. And it's, they're acting out this play, and you're, you're a role in this, and basically that, that, that's your person plays a role in this act here. Yeah? And whenever it's passed, yeah, relating to an offence, punishable in the indictment or a summary conviction. So actually, all these acts, yeah, it's a person. Yeah? If it says you, he, she, the defendant, everything like that, it's all a person. Yeah? There is no, unless it says the natural human being, you know, which it never does. Okay? So the other thing is, uh, every act is a public act to be judicially noted as such, unless the contrary is expressly provided by the Act. Now, just quickly, I want to talk about two sides of things here. I want to talk about public, and I want to talk about private. Okay, let's say, let's say we closed up this door, right, and sealed it all up, and we create this private space. No one's allowed in, we all agree this is private now. Literally, we can do anything. There is no law at this point, apart from what we agree, okay, because this is a private space, and yeah, we can we can do all sorts of things. You can smoke marijuana. You can do, do anything you want. Yeah, we can have a massive orgy. Yes, <laughs> and who would care? Because it's private. It's just us, right? No one's watching. Yes, but don't. Okay, put your put your scarf back on, sir. Oh. <laughs> so so basically, you know, we could do whatever we want in a private space. But as soon as we step into the public. We have to be completely different. We have to abide by these rules. We can't suddenly take off all our clothes and start running down the street. Well, you could, but you, know, you might get arrested. Um, these are, you know, this, we have public etiquette, don't we? we? We always say, oh, the public this, the public that. The public is a corporation. It's a corporation. And when you step into that corporation, you have to behave in a certain way. And that's what the public is. So when it says, one of the things, has anyone uh, heard about notaries? Anyone know about notaries? A notary public. A notary, notary public. Notary yeah, public. notary public. That's right. Okay, when we get into some of the Freeman stuff, and we were doing, so what we did was we did the first, well, the first thing I did was an affidavit, you know, which is like a sworn oath, okay? And I did that with John Harris's templates, and I just sent that off. And I used a solicitor for that. Now, a solicitor operates within the public. They don't operate outside of the public, yeah? If I want to take a solicitor's documents in the United Kingdom, and I want to use them in America, I have to use a notary, because a notary is in international law. Okay, it's the oldest form of the legal profession. It's what dates right back. And we can go on, and maybe we'll have a little bit of a chat about notaries now and the power of it, just as an aside. Okay? So when, we did, when I did something else, which is called a notice of understanding and intent and a claim of right, sounds a bit long. We can talk a little bit more about that at the end. One of the things I did, I used a notary to do it. And the reason is, is because I'm coming from my private jurisdiction and I want to serve notice into the public, that this is how it is now. This is the law. Yeah? This is my private law now coming into your public space. So now I'm serving this notice of that. And now I'm saying, has anyone in the public got a problem with my law? Okay? Because it's got a notary seal, and what it means is there's a big red seal at the bottom of the thing. You can wave that at the back of the court, and they're supposed to see it, because it's got a notary seal. They're not supposed to ignore it. Now, it's not necessarily what happens, <laughs> but it's what's supposed to happen, right? Okay, that's the whole point of it, yeah? But remember, these people have forgotten all about this. It's been a long time since the law was properly practiced. So actually, I'll just give you a bit of history on notaries. What happened was, um, it goes back to trusts, actually, trust law. And what happened was, with a trust, you had uh, a kind of, uh, someone who sort of put something into the trust, if you like. You've got someone who looks after that thing, and then a beneficiary. And where it comes from is in Roman law, what you had was, if a Roman soldier got married to uh, a common 
you know, English peasant or whatever it was, they were when they were gallivanting around. They might have a if if that Roman they had built this family and she would take on all the benefits of being a Roman. But if he died in battle, then she would and all his family would go back to the uh, peasantry, go back to the life of being a peasant. So what they what they did was they would strike deals with each other as Roman soldiers and say that if I die, you marry my wife, and if you die, I'll marry your wife, and that way, will be you know, the family will be secure in the future. So that was a private trust. They whispered in each other's ear, they didn't tell each other about it, and they just went and did it. So that was, that's kind of how that thing started. And eventually, after a while, a uh, notary was sort of born into the system as a, a man who would stand as a sort of respectable character, witness, yeah, and would note, just note everything that goes on. Yeah. And that's it, and then we just keep the record, and just sign it, this is what was said. Okay. That was the first form of law. Then after that, solicitors came along, and what they do is they operate within the law. Yeah, so they operate within statutes, and they're working out. They're actually working, supposedly, for you. Although it might not be the case. <laughs> so yeah, they're all working, working for you, trying to do all this work. But, with it, but they operate within statute law. So if you want to come out of statute law, you want to do your own private law, that's why we use the notary, because it's recognised globally. So I can take my negotiable instruments, if you like, Get the notary to sign it because that's one of those acts. The no, you know, the uh, the uh, <coughs> sorry, the, the negotiable instruments act. That's one of the only acts where you actually find a notary mentioned in it as having the power to sign and to, to witness a negotiable instrument. Okay, so very powerful things, notaries, and they're your. If you start to use them, they're they're very expensive compared to solicitors, which is five pounds. I think it's about eighty pounds or whatever. So it's a little bit more expensive a route to go. Uh, but I'm not saying it's actually necessary either. But it's just what you, what you feel comfortable with. Right? So, one of the th interesting words back then was includes. So as I said, this thing called legalese, it's a little bit confusing for many people. Very, very confusing thing. So, if I said includes, most people just think, oh, I get something with that. Uh, this this uh, laptop, this includes a projector. Okay, so you think, oh, I'll buy that laptop and I get a free projector with it. That sounds brilliant. Now, legalese doesn't mean the same thing. What it actually means is this laptop includes the projector. It means it doesn't include the laptop anymore. Because includes is to the exclusion of all else. When you say includes, it is only the thing that follows it that is included. Everything else is excluded. Unless you say includes without limitation. So when it says includes bodies corporate or not, uh, bodies political, corporate or unincorporated, actually means it doesn't include anything else apart from that, that only, the only thing it is. So persons are corporations, and persons are not anything except corporations. Okay? And that's why statute law. So let's have a good look. So there's the legal maxims, they call this. You can find this in Black's Law again. The inclusion of one is to the exclusion of all else. It's a legal maxim. Now, legal maxims came about because we were arguing so much in the courts that eventually it got down to a point where there's points that you just can't argue. So there became a standardisation, in other words. So actually, this well, it includes that, and it doesn't include anything else. So now on your contracts, every time you write that, you've got to write without limitation, or it only includes that. So this is a legal maxim. So just because there's so many arguments about it, they decide to sort it out. Therefore, includes means everything that's not deleted. I said that already, didn't I? It includes without limitation, we mentioned that. So what's the, what does that mean? It means that the truth is that persons are artificial constructs, corporate or unincorporated, and not human beings. Okay? So is everyone starting to get the difference between now what is real and this, this artificial thing? Yeah? Okay, so I'll just go through the last few points and then we'll maybe talk a little bit more about the birth certificate thing. Okay, so these are some of the corporations that you will see, well, you can find on the internet actually. Uh, this one here is the United Kingdom Limited. It got formed, United Kingdom PLC, I think, what saying, and then it got rebranded re once it sort of went bankrupt again. <laughs> and yeah, that's it, just, just keeps on collapsing. I wonder why. Oh, never mind. Maybe it's that, those huge wars we keep having. Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe it's because actually they don't ever. One interesting thing, actually, um, you might notice they're telling you all these things they spend money on, yeah? Do you notice they never tell you how much they make? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. <coughs> So I think if you start to sort of question all that, that would be very interesting. <laughs> I know that. Sure. So uh, how much money did you make last year then? In total? In gross, yeah. Yeah, what, of all these taxes and everything else you've been doing. I think you'll find, uh, I don't think we're in financial problems actually. 
I just think uh, you know it's, it's what they decide they want to make happen for certain people. But anyway, this is um, this is United Kingdom Limited. It's a very uh, quick access formation. Obviously, in a bit of a hurry to get it all through. Oh dear, we're going bankrupt tomorrow. Forgot. Damn. I don't know the country. So, um, oh yeah, this is Bristol City Council. Um, this is from a website called the Dun and Bradstreet, dnb.com. And what they do is they list all of the corporations within the United Kingdom. And one of those is all the council offices. You can find any, every single council that has ever come through has actually been registered as a corporation. And I'll tell you, they've got assets. They've got assets, them guys. Don't worry about you know, your council running out of money. They've got serious assets. I mean, if you look, these are all assets, and it goes on for pages, pages and pages. Bristol City Council's got more Bristol City Councils than I. I wouldn't even know which one to choose if I was going to sue them. Do you know what I mean? It'd <laughs> be <You're> difficult. <laughs> and just to prove that they're, um, they're a corporation, here's their corporate plan from 2008 to 2011. You can find this on their website, which actually now, now counts as adopting the corporate structure. Board of Directors to decide and uh, to make things happen. So there you are. So it's the, board, it's the corporate governance. Um, it's, been go it's, been on like, it's been that for a while, actually. It's been like that for a while, but what has happened is maybe the nature of corporations is changing because of the nature of money changing. So now it's becoming more obvious. Any questions about any of that so far? Yeah, can yes. you tell me, mag <laughs> magistrate courts, are they a corporation? <laughs> well, you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Uh, Ministry of Justice <laughs> and Bristol Magistrates Court. There you go. <laughs> no sooner did he ask, and there it was. Brilliant. Yes. So actually, I, I did. I did have. Had, I've had a little bit of experience down the courts. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, and I've, I've been down Bristol Magistrates Courts on a few times, yeah, waving my pieces of paper. Myself. Have you been in there yourself? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How was that? Not. Not very pleasant. <laughs> no. no, but do you know one thing about? Um, okay, we talk about the courts now. That's good. One thing I found quite interesting. It says on their website, work type: criminal, family work, betting, and gaming. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, let me just explain a little bit about that. <laughs> okay. So, criminal is like basically. Okay, let me tell you this. It's not criminal unless you say I'm not guilty or whatever it is. Yeah, not guilty is a criminal offence. You plead not guilty, it's a criminal offence. Then they take it criminal. Because basically, the moment, remember, you've got this duty, it's already, you got, they, what, from their perspective, they can only see the person, they can't see the human being. Okay? So when, when, the, when they see you, they're actually saying, oh, this is a person, I can't see a human being, I'm not able to. It's not in, within my remit to look at them. So you know, if, they get, if they think they've got a person there, they can sort of say, well, if he says not guilty, we know that person already has the duty to repay because we're in debt, so they've got to repay already. So it doesn't matter you know, anything about that. But they say they're not guilty. Right, now it's criminal because actually you've gone against the state. And now you're an enemy of the state. That's what it is. You're an occupier. Remember that. You occupy your residency. Residence. We're on the re side. You're on the other side. Yeah? Does that make any sense? Okay, occupier. Yeah. When you have an occupation, what is that? Yeah. Well, think about it. Anyway, so betting and gaming, let me just explain why, why I think it is. So what happens in a court is that the, this artificial person has created an offence, an offence. And someone is offended somewhere, probably Her Majesty, and says, oh my god, <laughs> Mr. Bill the man, or whatever it is. So, so she sends the bill, right, and there he is, and he's ready to take this, uh, this bill, uh, and now they're like, right, who can we find to take the bill? And then they sort of hunt around and they say, right, we've got, we've got an address here, an address. Yeah? So they go to that address and they say, can we find someone who can pay the bill? Right, uh, maybe you'll do. Yeah? And what's your name, they ask you. And if you, if you, if you say my name is blah, 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 whatever, and they match you, say, oh, right, we found someone, we can, we can take them. And so they grab you and they put you in the court. And what that is, is it's a wager. Now, if they can't find it, and they can't find that human being, do you know what happens? They have to pay it. <laughs> because it's, they have to pay it. It's a, it's a gambling wager. I bet we can find someone to come into this court and say, yes, I am. Because then we go, oh, I've got them. All right, brilliant. If not, it's the prosecutor who has to pay. Okay? So it's all a wagering, a betting and wagering scheme. That's what it is, right? Any questions on that? So it's the prosecutor, the debt. Sorry, okay, let's just say one question. Talk about that. What if you are that person? Don't you know, admit to being that person? Okay. So let's just go back. <laughs> okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, well, let's go back. Let's go back. What if I am that person? Remember, you have a person. What if I if I'm the owner of that person? Yeah. 
and then you say yes it's me yeah okay if you say yes it's me you, you create a joinder remember every contract everything is about what you say so now you've created what's known as a joinder you've connected yourself to that person now okay you've agreed to be him in the game the playing piece let's wheel you off so you can now be the playing piece of defendant and they stick you down as defendant right so if, if they come to you and they say, are you that person? That's an interesting question. Isn't the third it? party to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you could be a number of things, actually. You could say, well, I'm, I'm an authorised representative. Yeah. yeah? Well, There's another way. Yeah? Because yeah. you could be authorised to represent that thing. And who authorised it? Well, I do. Because <laughs> I'm the almighty power behind that thing. I'm the human being. <laughs> yeah. That's what I am, you know. And yeah, not to say that they will understand what you're saying, they'll probably think you're a bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry about that, at least you know what you're on about. And maybe it'll start to sink in after they do it four or five hundred times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, a funny little story, just aside about the police, right? My, uh, the guy, you know, so Guy Taylor, he's on tomorrow night on Sky. We did this interview with him. He was quite funny, and he'll tell you the story on that, but if you miss it, I just want to recount it now. He basically uh, got arrested. They came around his house, five in the morning, the police kicked in the door arrested him and took him down the station. And he's like, well, what am I here for? And so he said, uh, well, you know, um, you've been sending letters to the council. So he said, well, yeah, what's, what's, what's all that? Well, you know, they've been complaining about, yeah, the letters you've been sending, very, yeah, very strict and things like that. He said, no, no, okay. They said, well, I want an interview about it. He said, okay, I'd, I'd like to take an interview. So um, they take him next door into the interview room. Two nice uh, young uh, uh, female coppers with that. And... Uh, and he was asking, he said, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll answer any question. He said, any question you want. Yeah? Uh, as long as you answer me uh, one question in return. So, okay, that sounds right. Yeah, so, okay, he says, so uh, what does Article 81 of the Magna Carta say? <laughs> and they both sort of stopped and they're like, um, actually, we don't even know what the Magna Carta is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he said, well, we've got a problem there. We've got a little problem there because. 81 of the Magna Carta says that all police officers and judges and other officials of that ilk yeah. shall know the law. And you're telling me that there's a, you don't know that there's a law telling you that you should know the law. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you want to have a discussion with me about the law. <laughs> We're not gonna, it's not going to work, is it? <laughs> so, actually, they, they, after they shortly de-arrested him and put him back in his home. But, <laughs> but, you know... <laughs> You can, okay. you can have a laugh with it, you can have a laugh with it. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. What I'm saying is, yeah, there is a dangerous side to this. Some of these people are psychopaths and they will lock you up. But, but generally speaking, also, there's the human side to it. So, uh, did that answer your question before? Yeah. About that, you have a person, yeah? yeah. You, so, so, so if you're a human <coughs> being, but you don't admit to being attached to that person, or represent that person... Do we get into a bit more detail for the break? Yes. Yeah, we'll yeah. probably have a problem. Yeah, that's a break. break. Um, we'll take a quick break, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever you want. And then we'll come back and we'll, we'll, we'll carry and we'll on. And we'll start getting into yeah. the whole nitty gritty of it. And, and about how to do stuff. stuff. Because yeah. I'm sure you're all gagging to know how to do stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right, so uh, we're covering quite a lot of ground um, about this fiction stuff, right? Um, what I would like to do is I'd like to just carry on a little bit longer and then maybe we could run through some actual processes because I think that will tie in. Sorry, I'm still. Oh, there really. uh, yeah, so we can bring it down to earth a little bit, so it's not just like you know a, a, a theory. It's actually some some practical stuff as well. Uh, so we've got as far as the courts. Uh, actually, so far, have we got any questions about what we covered in the first half? Of it? No, it's it it fairly okay. It's fairly okay. Yeah? Okay, let's just carry on then. Here we go. So the corporate you. And this is where we get to the uh, interesting part because it's all about us. That's what we like. Uh, we can relate this now. So a name in capital letters. So, a name in capital letters. One, where do you see names in capital letters? On the birth certificate. On the birth certificate? Yeah. Like that. Bank. Driving license, passport. Bank. Bills. Bank. Bank. Bills. And the other one? Greystone. Greystone, that was it, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for that. So, why did you get it? Because it's dead. That's what it is, isn't it? It's a, it's a dead thing. A there is no life, it's a corpse. It's a corpse oration. Corporation. Corporation. Yeah. <laughs> Now what happens is, uh, alongside this, you'll often get this, uh, what they call a title, okay? Mr, Miss, Ms, Ms, something like that, anyway. Uh, just quickly about title, does, uh, does everyone know where title comes from? 
about the registration process. Should we stop here and go into birth certificates quickly? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so quickly, what happened was, was that we were born, yeah, we, we, can, we came down the birth canal, yeah, we were birthed into the seas of commerce, okay? It's like Admiralty Law, okay? That's what we were birthed into. And what happened was when they got, uh, there was this thing with the law, and at some point they got quite esoteric about it when it wasn't quite working out. And they said, well, okay, I tell you what, we're spiritual beings, and this, this here, this is a vessel, okay? And this is our vessel, and when we birthed, when the ship is birthed into the uh, seas of commerce, and our vessel is there, a sail, what we should do is we should, we should try and register the thing, yeah? so we know that it actually exists on the system. If you think about that. So what they do is they get this thing called a birth certificate, and the mother is, is, a, is an informant, informant, and so is the father. Yeah. Uh, and then basically that, they're, they're witnesses, if you like, to the fact. Yeah? So they sign it all off. And what that does is that creates uh, a registration. Now, whenever you register something in the legal world, two things happen. You get legal title and legal ownership. Yeah. So you have equitable use, they call it. Yeah? So in other words, you have equitable use of your human body, uh, but they own the title to it. That's what, that's what that birth certificate is, because that birth certificate goes off. Now, let me explain why. I'm just going to go back to this money thing. Okay, so we were there. Everything was going all right, and it all went bankrupt, and then we had to lend on this money and borrow this money and you know, da, 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 all this other stuff. And what happened was it kept on going bankrupt until the fact that it couldn't really support itself anymore with the financial model. So what they had to do is they had to kind of say, well, what should we do? Well, they said, well, we've got this law of the sea that we've created called Admiralty Law. And what we can do is we can bring that onto land because that's, all, that's the law of negotiable instruments. And that, let me just give you a little bit of a background on Admiralty Law. Why that came about was because with the expansion of civilization when it started to cross the seas, it was a very risky business. So if, if let's say, someone ladened up a ship full of goods, the ship owner would take all the risk and then would set sail on the seas of commerce, uh, or the seas, there you go, and try and deliver that thing and then would receive his cut. But what happened then, because it was like quite a risky business, a lot of the ships would sink. And the ship owners were like, well, this isn't actually making us any money. Well, they couldn't let that happen because they had to have this international trade thing going. So it developed these laws of limited liability, which meant that the ship owner would only take partial responsibility for any losses. Now, if you look at the Titanic, that's a good example of one of those ships that sunk, and the first thing they did was file a uh, limited uh, liability um, sort of thing into the courts so that they could be sued for everything. So the thing about limited liability is that it limits the amount that the ship owner has to pay kind of thing. So in a way, what happens is, you could look at that like now, if you take it to the human aspect, yeah, we've got this vessel, and we're the ship's owner, and we get limited liability insurance, which is our national insurance. Okay? And the way that happens is, is that they, we take our birth certificate, it registers us. Now that birth certificate is uh, evidence of life, if you like. Yeah? Now life is the only thing that can actually create commercial energy now. So it's not the gold, it's nothing like that, it's to do with human beings, the commercial energy. And what happens is that that registration goes off and then it comes back. And you can go now and get copies of that registration to prove that, that you were registered, yeah? And when you were registered, that's, that creates a document which is the title holder. So the person who holds the original document, which won't be us, will go off somewhere, actually I think to the World Bank is what I think, under the Emergencies Act of 1954 or whatever it was, um, something like that, anyway. Under the Emergencies Act, it's the end of the Second World War it was, and they had this thing where they said we we're gonna um, put all the birth certificates into a central centralised place in case Hitler moved in. Right? Uh, so, they, so they had the League of Nations and they put it all into there. Then it became uh, United Nations after that. And that, they, that had the IMF and everything else like this into it. And I think that's where the birth certificates are held nowadays, the original copy, the original document. Now what you can get is certified copies from the original issuer. So they hold that and they say, okay, that means that country's got X amount number of people all registered with us. So we know that if we tax them this much, we're going to make this amount of money, which means over this amount of time, we're going to make this amount of money, which means we can lend this amount of money to the government. Sort of and that's how it works. We are registered as stock, stock for the corporation, and then it says we're going to create this money for the corporation. Okay, you can borrow this money then to keep your thing going. So <coughs> what happens is they look after you kind of thing. There's two actually key points. One is when you turn seven and become master. And master, and then you, you lose the master title uh, um, when you get your national insurance about 16 or whatever it is. Uh, and that, that 
that then gives you the, the mister title, sort of thing. Okay? So if you come from master to mister. Who would rather be the master? Huh. Okay. Yeah. So actually, next time they say, oh, you mister, blah, blah, blah. I don't argue. I'm the master. <laughs> Which is one thing that has been tried and was quite an interesting response because it's actually developing a language they can work with now because they know what a master is, right? So uh, just uh, you've got to play with the words a little bit. So to be a master or a Mr. Mrs. Ms. whatever you want to be, that, that is just the legal fiction title which represents, represents, represents. Okay, so we talked about the national insurance number. This is your number. So let me just go back to this birth certificate. Imagine uh, the whole thing is bankrupt. Okay, so you know when you pull out your notes, it says, I promise to pay? Okay, that's a promise to pay note. That's a promissory note. What that means is, is actually, I'm handing you this. And one day, when the system comes back into uh, uh, liquidity, you know, once we've got the, uh, once the uh, substance is back into it, yeah, and we're not bankrupt anymore, I'm going to pay you. Yeah, but until that point, you're going to have to accept this promise to pay. Now the thing is, actually, what happens is, we have this Bank of England thing which issues these notes. It's actually their property, it's got their two signatures. That's because they're the people who owe you the money, actually. Okay, because you're... You know what I mean? They're, they're saying, okay, we realise that your society hasn't got any real asset, solid thing that we can count on. So what we do is we just count on the, the faith. And we'll, we'll give you these notes and you can use those. Yeah? But there isn't any law that says you have to. That's a very important point. Because you can pay with, with however you want, right? You don't have to use their notes. Yes? I've used proceeds to pay for cigarettes before. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> what, in full? Yeah, just the amount of uh, what cigarettes where I've used the amount. Yeah. Good. Brilliant. <laughs> See? Now that is that's that's the good outside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's it's true, because there isn't actually any reason why you need to pay with a promissory note of, from someone else. Because anything a corporation can do, a human being can do, and even better actually, yeah. So one of the things about this birth certificate bond is that they hold that. Now what happened was the whole system was completely uh, bankrupt, yeah, so we can't pay for anything, so they, they offer us this system. There's no obligation to use it, it's a choice. So what happened was with this birth certificate thing, they kind of made this infinite pool of money. It, infinite, because do you know why? It's because as a human being, your concepts are infinite. You, the amount of commercial worth that you can have in one idea is, is virtually infinite. I give, often give the uh, analogy of a guy who walks into the Swan Vestas and says, I know how to make you a million quid. Yeah? And so... Uh, but it's going to cost you a million quid a year, but it's going to cost you like a million quid to find out. So they think, oh, in one year we'll work it out. So, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll pay you the million quid. What is it? He said, just take the, the striker off one side and only have, it, only have it on one side. So you don't need it on both sides. That'll save you money because you know, people don't need it on both sides. So he said, oh, all right, brilliant. Yeah, we'll just save ourselves a million quid. Here's your million quid. A year later, they started making all the money, right? So that was one idea, one concept, one instant, one million quid. So it's very quick, yeah? So actually, we're actually infinite. So there's this thing they call that tontine, which they pull all the birth certificates into, and then afterwards they work out roughly how much tax the, the person is going to pay, and then they base it all on that. But you as a human being are infinite. Your value is infinite. You cannot ever be in debt, because as much debt as they throw at you, you can just sign it off. That's the reality. Well, it should be the reality, but they're not quite there yet. <laughs> they're getting there. So the thing about the birth certificate is actually that is their gift to you, really, to say, right, your thing's... We, you know, we realise that you've got to pay, here's a remedy. Because wherever they create this, 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 this problem where they can't pay for anything, they have to bring a remedy by law. And they have to abide by that, it's natural law. Okay? You can't just go and create a problem and then not give anyone a way to do anything about it. It's like cruelty then, isn't it? You know, terrible. Okay, so the birth certificates are all registered. That. After that, well, they, that's a trust situation. We talked about trusts. So here you are, yeah? you're the property being put into the trust, in a way, yeah? And who's the beneficiary then? It becomes, let's say, the corporation, it becomes the, 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 set, uh, the setter who's, who's making it. Yeah? You've got the man. Sorry, the other way around. The, the man, if you think about the human being, I say man, yeah, comes into the arrangement. Then at the top here, you've got the government corporation, which is the trustee. Okay? And then the beneficiary is the public. Okay? So as a benefit, privilege... As, work, as a member of the public, what they do is they give you a national insurance number so now you can work, yeah, as a privilege to work in this thing with a number, you yeah, see? By the way, going to jail is a privilege, paying council tax are all privileges, right? They're benefits and privileges. That's everything that the society operates through. So actually, if 
what happened was when they made that this is a secondary trust, they call it a SESTA K trust, and they inverted that arrangement. So now what happens is the government goes in, sorry, uh, the, the government goes in and makes the, the, the human being the trustee of that account, and then the beneficiary is the public. Okay, so they did one trust one way, and they flipped it back the other way. So on the one hand, you're the trustee at the birth certificate level, then they make another trust, which the government becomes the, uh, the, the beneficiary. Yeah? So you're the trustee of that trust. That's why you have to pay, and that's why you have the duties. Okay, is anyone with me on that? A little bit complicated, but is anyone with me on that? Yeah, should we go through it one more time? So, here's, imagine there's this thing, let's call it a, a, a shape like that. It's like a human being, yeah? That, that thing comes into this world, and it looks around and says, wow, what am I doing here, yeah? And they say, well, I'm sorry you've been born at this time because we don't have any money for you yet and we've got no way you can pay for any of this stuff. So instead, what we'll do is, okay, if, if uh, you come in here, we'll be the trustee. We'll look after you, yeah, and we'll give benefit privileges into the society, the public. Okay, so now you're growing up, you're growing up, you're growing up, and now you've got this property here. And now we're doing, oh, this property now, as part of the public, we'll create another trust, which is now going back the other way. So this time, the, the public being the, the set or the person who's putting into it, because they're the trustee of the original trust, saying, what should we do with all this cash, this infinite cash we've got from this human being? They said, well, let's, we can't have infinite in the public, so let's limit it. And what we do is we bring it in, <coughs> controlled in a controlled fashion, and here you have your, your, your public, and who becomes the trustee now? They say, right, we're going to make you trustee of this new trust. Back to you. Yeah? So now you can be responsible for managing the funds of everything that the person does. So, okay, so then it's about this way. So it's just a law, switching it around the trust. And if you, can, um, if you can imagine this, one of the things about the Freeman stuff is that what we're looking at now is trusts more and more and how they work. Because then when you go to court, it's a trust relationship and everything like this. So if you can really understand how that relationship works and wrap your head around it, that's a very, very powerful insight. So anyway, that's national insurance number and why you've got that. Uh, the other thing they did was create an address. Uh, remember, uh, people with an address or persons with an address are residents, resided. Okay, so you were born in this thing, you went into the public, which is bankrupt, it's a treasonable offence to be in there because it's bankrupt, yeah? Uh, and you're operating this thing in complete fraud and you're taking part in it, you're completely guilty, you're against God, and you've resided in, onto the dark side. And that's why, why now you've got a duty to pay. Right? And that's what, that's what a re reside is, resident. Okay? <coughs> the other way of looking at it is an occupier. Yeah, an occupier, as we stated before, is someone who is in occupation of land. They're not in peaceful inhabitant. Now, there is a root in the Freeman thing called peaceful inhabitant, which means I'm not an occupier, I'm a peaceful inhabitant, which means I don't have an address. Okay? I'm just peacefully on the land. Okay, that's all. Uh, and that has worked in certain occasions as well. So um, the other thing about an address, what's key about it is the postcode. So a lot of people, when they've been writing their documents, e either A, haven't been using a postcode, or B, have been putting it in square brackets. Uh, and the reason you do that on legal documents is because when you put something in a box in law, what it means is that doesn't exist, it's only for guidance. So actually, by putting it in square brackets, what it means is you're taking the postcode off the document, and now it's, it, you're not allowed to read it out as having a postcode in legally. Okay. Any questions about addresses? Okay, good. I'd like to make a formal address. Okay, right, story of freedom. I'll tell you what, I'm going to do a story of freedom in just a bit. Why did I leave some links up and maybe we could talk about some processes so that we got some positive solutions. Somebody mentioned council tax. Yeah, a little bit of council tax. Anyone else had any problems in court recently? <laughs> We're talking, weren't we, about some yeah, of the problems? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll tell you what, um, do you want, shall I start by talking a little bit about my life and my experience in the whole thing? Because yeah. yeah, I, don't, I don't want to see I'm just standing here just talking <coughs> about stuff. Yeah, I've actually tried something out. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, first thing I did was um, the John Harris affidavit. And it was quite funny because I went up to this uh, Bush and Bush solicitors up in Clifton, I don't know if you know it, yeah, and got it signed off, 13th of October. Uh, and two months later, got the second one signed off. And each time it was the same solicitor. It was uh, R.E. Blair, 
And I thought it was quite funny at the time. <laughs> and I was bush and bush and I was like, <laughs> the, way, the way the universe works sometimes. So I sent them like, <laughs> And then, um, so at that point, I'm sort of like, yeah, okay, I've done the paperwork. I'm going to stop paying. All right, so I stopped paying the council tax. They're going to take you to court. I'm like, no, I'm going to take you to court. Are they going to take me to court? They are taking me to court. But I did go to court. So my first time in court, we rocked up in there, quite a few, quite a few of us actually, just to see what happened. And uh, they, yes, he invited me in. To, this guy invited me into this space. Yeah, I got the recording actually. I should, I'll put it out on the on the net somewhere. You've got the sorry. You've got the recording. You recorded it. I recorded all of my court cases. Yeah, everything like that. On video. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you allowed to? Oh, Norman Scott. I did. <laughs> I don't know. Are you allowed to? I don't know. I, I did. <laughs> it's my bloody court, right? Do what I want. And if they're not going to, not going to supply that, someone to take a record, then I'm going to take the record. That's it. Okay, right? That's it. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, so, besides, I put it. I did later put it in my in my claim right under the right to film at any event that I'm at. Yeah. So, so anyway. Um, but, so I went into this uh, little room and I got invited in there and what they do with the council tax is uh, they, they sort of invite you up, you know, oh have you, got, have you got problems paying the bill? Now it kind of reminds me of my mum, she's uh, very good at market research right and they, they do these things where they go and sell these timeshares yeah and what they do is they try and sell the timeshare and then someone stands up and goes oh that was a brilliant idea, oh I'll, I'll join and they rush off yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's a plant. I know that's a plant. Because actually once one person, then, oh, next person, next person. So that, they, then she would get down to just my mum left on her own. Because she understood that it was a plant and it was all cotton. And uh, they said to her, oh, is it the money? She said. And she said, oh, no, it's not the money. I'm, I'm quite, I can afford it. I just don't think it's a very good idea. And at that point, they stumbles them because they're like, they expect everyone to say, yeah, it's a bit expensive. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, we could do this deal. You see? And that's the same as the council tax. Yeah? They say, is it the money? You get that? And you oh, oh yes, yeah, the money. Oh, well, what about this? What about if we work out this payment plan? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. And in fact, I, the same day I had my court case, I had another guy who did his court case, and he actually did, actually did a bartering system with him. He actually got 50% off his council tax because he said, I'll, I'll pay you half, but I'm not paying for the other half because half is, I disagree with well, you know, the wars and everything like that, but I'll pay you half. And they agreed. So, so you yeah, know, it's all up for the negotiation. So, so, <laughs> so, um, so I was in there, and the guy said to me, is it the money? And I said, no, it's not the money. So he's like, oh. And you see him free. He's like, well, what is it then? I said, no, I'm just coming here to make sure my evidence goes in, into the court. I just want, I just want, just want you to read out the evidence, that's all. I want a fair hearing? That's all right, yeah. So he got very worried at that point. Let me just explain that before this, I had actually gone into the police uh, and sort of tried to report this treason, because I'd met this other guy who got this treason CD, so I tried to do that. We actually walked in with the Z1 on our shoulder, and <laughs> we filmed the whole thing. And uh, yeah, I actually got this, uh, this police officer, I was in his office, and he said, oh, I'm not going to just explain the case, I'm not going to take the paperwork. And so I explained it to him, yeah, and, uh, and, after, and there was this whole kind of kerfuffle sort of went on sort of thing. And eventually I got all the special branch involved, and it was all turning with pear shapes and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, because I'd done all this with, with the treason thing, obviously, uh, you know, that was all in the affidavit, right? Okay. <laughs> so, so they're like reading through this, like, oh my God, what are we going to do? So they left me, obviously, to the end, and then I walked in, and then basically, you know, is Mr. Williams there? Uh, we're the lawful representative. Yeah, we, 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 we did mess it up a little bit. We didn't, I've never been at the court before. We just bust in there. I claim all my unalienable human rights. <laughs> <laughs> and they all said to me, um, could you sit down first? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, just tell me when. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yep. No, yeah. okay. So, <laughs> and then there was this whole kind of discussion about, you're Mr. Williams. No, I'm the, I'm the legal representative. And you always go to this discussion sort of thing. And there's ways around that now. I, you know, now I know you could say, you could let them do all their charade and then say, I just deny all the presumptions the court has made. And that, that's a quite a good, um, good sort of stumbler because they're like well okay we can't presume anything because only what's actually on the record because they do they make uh, assumptions about stuff all the time these courts so you have to re you have to rebut even the assumptions sometimes and that's an easy way to do it so yeah anyway, i'm up there and i'm like saying um i'm here you know, i'm here representing i've got this and i even had uh, i'd knocked up that morning like a uh, power of attorney and just signed it <laughs> so here's my power of attorney Mark. and uh, oh is it the original he's like shaking uh, yeah yeah it's an original anyway at the end of it, they, they ruled as if I wasn't there, because I can't see you, sorry. Uh, so they disappeared, and then I've never seen a barrister, uh, what are they called, the clerk of the court. So 
So he he pole vaulted almost over the uh, over the uh, banister and came running up to me and was like, "What's this? What's this? What's this? Have a name it. Is it the rebellion?" And I was like, "Well, yeah, it's something like that." <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, then uh, actually, but yeah, I never I never really ended up. Yeah, never really nothing came of it anyway because you know they just sent me these letters and the bailiff would turn up and we'd say, "You say, oh, are you Mr. Williams?" We'd say, "No." Oh, okay, well, I'll come back when he's in. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably, that's probably <laughs> so, that's what I do now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. I mean, that's it, yeah. You're asking for a legal fiction. To get, well, you're not, as long as you realise that, yeah. You could, you could argue that in court, that'd be funny. Don't they have a right to ask you for ID? You have a right to ask them for ID. In fact, let's talk about that. The bailiff busters. Do you know about the bailiff busters? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, some people have used them, yeah. yeah. You can get bailiffs running down the road with this stuff because basically whatever, the first rule of being a bailiff is don't sign anything, okay? So the first thing what you do is you actually give them a contract. Sorry, so they, you, know, you answer the door, bailiff in the door, hello, 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 hello. Blah, 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 are you blah, blah, blah. And you say, right, I don't know you, yeah, but I'm going to assume this is a commercial, I'm going to assume this is a commercial engagement, right? Now I charge £6,000 uh, an hour, which is... Uh, <laughs> Thousand pound every ten minutes, right? Okay, so, so, so basically, uh, if you could just fill out this form, yeah, and just so we can identify who you are, so I can pay you, yeah, my payment, yeah. So then you hand in the, the form, and it says an edit thing, just simple things like, yeah, what's your name? What's the name of your company? What's the name of your boss? Yeah, what's your company number? Yeah, where do you live? <laughs> okay. It's just like forms like they would want to get out of you, right? So you just throw all that information you want to find all that out of them, because actually, how are you going to get your payment off them? You don't, yeah. And at the bottom, they just ask them to sign it. Now, what quite often, well, actually, almost, yeah, always, always they run away, yeah, because they can't, they can't be signing pieces of paper, yeah. But yeah, uh, it's just a tactic, yeah. We actually got it down to this little business card. You can get them to, you can hand out, and uh, they can just sign the back, and it's just like a contract. Yeah. <laughs> so remember, a bailiff comes to your door. They're third party. So what does that mean? Okay, let's uh, give you the example of a credit card. Okay, so this credit card. Remember, you've gone into this thing. This bank, yeah? You've signed this piece of paper and created new money. They bundled that money up and sold it. Now they've got this money, they put it on an account that you can borrow from and they can charge you interest from. Now that interest is split with the investors. Yeah? So <coughs> that's the how it's working. So that is, if you like, if there was a contract, it's not. But if it was a contract, then it would be between you and the bank or whoever did the credit card. So what they try and do is once you don't pay, then they, then they sort of oh, well, blah, 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 let's get these, let's sell on the debt. So they sell it on for however much they can get for it, and these these corporation, other corporations buy them up, and then they come around to your house and say, oh yeah, you've got this debt, you've got this debt sort of thing. But the point is, you never ever went into contract with these people. So actually, don't worry, I can we can provide. You say <laughs> you want a contract? All right, yeah, I can provide such <laughs> such an article. And here it is. And if you could just put your name and the details here, and this is the, these are the, this is the cost. You've got to tell me how much it costs. You've got to go into contracts, yeah? So if they want to talk to you, then you can do that. And it has worked extremely well, especially once you start to understand due process. So <clears throat> any questions on that so far? Yes. You know the contract that you can get them to sign to mm -hmm. charge them a fee? Say they have to be signed it without stand up in court, in their courts. My reckon. Yeah. Contract, they signed it. In fact, what's quite cool is that you could you could say right, can um, you ask them if they can produce a contract in court? I accept everything you're saying. Let's talk about conditional acceptance. Very very powerful if you can understand it. Everything is about process, okay? <laughs> so remember about the duty thing. You're under duty to pay, okay? As long as you do have actually done the thing or whatever. Yeah? There's nothing, no way out of it. There's no way out of it. Yeah? So you never want to say I refuse because that's what's called contempt, because yeah? that means actually. You're being a bit of a child now. You know, you're sort of trying to negotiate, negate your duty. Yeah. Your duty is to stand there as an adult and say, oh, I accept, I accept, I yeah, accept what you're saying. I accept what you're saying. And I accept every word of it upon proof of claim. And that's the key word, upon proof of claim. Acceptance upon proof of claim means that they need to supply evidence along with their claim. So what happens is everyone holds a claim here. I've got this claim on this, this legal fiction here. They, didn't, they went into a contract with us. They did this, they did that, they did that. Okay, I accept it on proof of claim. <coughs> Provide me the contract. Now, just remember, contracts have a very interesting thing because they're two-party agreements, which means you need two signatures on them. No credit card agreement actually has two signatures on. It's just one. That's because it's not a contract. It's a negotiable instrument. So... <coughs> 
they can't actually supply the contract. So I know lots of people have gone into courts and they said, well, where's the contract? Just like that. Uh, I accept what you're saying, but where's the contract? They haven't sent it to me. Uh, because I, yeah, I haven't seen the contract yet. At this point, the judge says, well, where's the contract? And the guy goes, shuffles his paper and goes, ah, oh, uh, we're going to get it. And then court adjourned. Normally it doesn't come back. <laughs> okay. The other thing is, actually, because you know, sometimes these people are a little bit aggressive, yeah. so what you can do is you can actually uh, follow the due process through a little bit further. Okay. So if someone makes a claim, okay, that means I'm making a statement and I'm holding a claim. At the moment I say something, I make a claim. Okay. Now I need to support the claim with evidence. So let's say, okay, someone's made a claim against me for you know, my credit card or whatever it is. So I say, okay, I accept. I accept what you're saying upon proof of upon upon proof of claim. Now they keep hassling me every day, and they don't give me this proof of claim. And I'm keep well, I'm accepting what you're saying. I'm willing to pay as long as you show me the proof of claim. Okay. Uh, if it goes on for a while, what you can do then is, like, let's say, okay, on this date I wrote to you asked for proof of claim. Okay. On this date you sent me this letter without the proof of claim. Now I'm warning you. If I don't get the proof of claim within the next amount of days, I'm going to instigate that fee schedule. They call it fee schedule. So now what happens is they send you more letters. Now you send them a letter saying, right, blah, 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 blah. You didn't do it, so now I'm going to send you a fee schedule. My fees are this. And make sure they're high. Because you're a human being, and human beings are mightily expensive to, to, to run. You know, they've got a lot of food that needs to go in there, housing and everything like that. Yeah? There's corporations that don't really need any of that. But um, human beings are very expensive. Yeah? So actually make sure your fees are very high and make sure it's going to very, very quickly outweigh them. So for every letter you write that I have to respond to, it's going to be £5,000. For every, you know, every time you tell, call me up, it's going to be £1,000. Okay. So now, if you send someone to my door, it's like £10,000 an hour, whatever you want. Okay. But make sure you list it all. Uh, one of my friends did, a, did this process when he, he, did occupy, he occupied Stonehenge this year. And, uh, he was actually there in a field on National Heritage Land, lucky, yeah. and it's lucky, yeah, uh, in his caravan, and the police will come to move him off, and uh, he says, okay, uh, have you got my, my check? And they're like, what? Well, here's my agreement, and he shows, he shows the police the agreement, and he's reading it down there, he's like, you know, it's just like, like any agreement, you know, subjects, uh, terms and conditions are subject to change without notice, is one of the things he's got on there, I mean, quite fun. <laughs> one of the last clauses were, and £1,000 for every smile you ask me to wipe off my face. <laughs> <laughs> Thousand pounds per step, yeah, and all this sort of stuff, you know. So just really, you know, just go for it, right? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. But if so, you don't sign it, does that does mean you don't you only read it, doesn't it? Okay, remember, signing something's not bad, right? If it's in your favour, okay. If you sign something and say this is me and I'm putting my yeah, sure. my my name. They didn't it. sign. Well, what you do is you okay. So let's talk about this. When you serve something, okay, that's giving notice. Right, if you write notice at the top, you have to take note. They have to. They're in the public. It's a law, but they have to take note. That's where <coughs> notaries, they serve notices, because they have to notice, which means they need to take note of the thing. So now, you've sent it in the post, bang, it's already legal service. You can send an email. still legal service, by the way. It doesn't have to be in the physical paper. Maybe think about that. You know, save those trees, you know, as long as they get a bit of a battering. The only thing is the notary seal doesn't stick to the screen quite so well and doesn't go with the thing, but... Apart from that, you know, you can send you can send an email, an attachment, or whatever. One of the other things I'd like to mention is that with affidavits, when you when you make service, don't send the original. That is your instrument that's worth the money. The thing with the original signature. I'm talking about when you send affidavits that you're going to turn into commercial instruments, because it's the signature that gives it the power. So you send a certified copy, and say this is a certified copy of the thing. That's giving the public notice now that there's this thing which is your private instrument. Does that make any sense? Yeah? So, uh, where, we, where were we going with that? We were going with due process, weren't we? Stonehenge. Yeah, the Stonehenge thing, yeah. So he's, he's got this whole uh, notice that he's served, yeah, and he's holding the original, yeah? This is my notice, blah, blah, blah. He stayed there uh, t over two weeks, and they had to have the, the people sat on the gate, just sat there, like, guarding the gate for the whole two weeks. Nothing they could do, they couldn't move him. Now, the last people who tried that was uh, a bunch of people called the Wallis, and that was back in the ba Battle of the Beanfields. In the Battle of the Beanfields, what happened was there was a kind of um, real kind of violent behaviour from the police towards the traveller community, and uh, it turned very nasty. Anyway, <coughs> one of the guys called Wally was the last person, he said, I'm going to camp up on this field, and he wrote this beautiful letter in a quite a fun kind of way. 
And what actually happened to him is the police came, they sort of beat him up, they threw him into a, uh, a mental, mental institute, basically, they pumped him for the drugs, and he died a couple of weeks later after that. And actually what happened was, with my mate Lockie, he was on this uh, land, it was that he was given the, the letter that, that the original Wally had written, and it had like all this very friendly, childlike kind of letter, just sort of a, a peace sort of thing. But uh, compared to where it's come to now, which was like you know, the, more of an aggressive stance, you can see actually, you know, it's a, it's a change in, in, in relationship, yeah? because actually you can't. You know, these people can be a bit nasty sometimes, and we're trying to move in a peaceful kind of way. And sometimes the only way to do it is, is money, because yeah? it's the only thing they understand at the end of the day. You know, take money off them, they, they really understand that. Mm -hmm. um, other thing with morality, they're not too, not too, not too sort of clever about. But anyway, he's, uh, yeah, so that's my mate Lockie, and he's, um, he's doing some tremendous work. Um, I was talking about due process, wasn't I? So I want to go th back through that. So this due process is very important because you can do so much with it if you understand what's going on. Now, basically, in law, you're, you, are sp you are allowed what's, what's known as a fair trial. Okay? So am I allowed a fair trial, you say in the court? Well, of course, of course. I'm not going to say, no, you're not. Otherwise, it would sound terrible, wouldn't it? You're here in the court, and, and you're not allowed a fair trial. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, am I allowed a fair trial? Okay, brilliant. So, um, you know... That, what that means is that basically they get a chance to present their evidence and you get a chance to rebut that evidence. Yeah? So actually you ask for the evidence yeah? and if they can't produce it, and then this is it, this is due process. Now one of the things you can kind of do is that, remember about this claim thing. So everything in the, what we talk about these courts are admiralty courts. There's no innocent plea anymore. There's only <laughs> guilty because you have a duty. Right? You have a duty and that means you can't be innocent because you have a duty to pay, whatever it is. So the only thing you can plead is not guilty, which is going against the state. Guilds, by the way, are a form of money. It goes back to money all the time. Do you know much about demurra? Demurra? Yeah. Demurra? It's, it's like no plea. Oh, right, yeah. No you can go no plea, you're right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they don't like that either, because that's what I did when I first went to court. <laughs> and they locked me up for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we'll get back onto that story in a bit. But, um, so this whole thing about due process is very important because what, what it is is if someone's got a claim, I, I am allowed to put in a counterclaim. In fact, if, you wanna, if you're guilty of something, okay, like I'm guilty of speeding, then that one, I'm not saying it's the way, but a way that you can do this is to balance the scales with the counterclaim. Okay, so let's say, let's say um, you know this uh, idea of going into uh, a contract, like we said with a you can go into contract with your government, you can go into contract with the Queen, anyone. You can write your own contracts for that. And you follow the due process. That's what we use a notary for, because it's coming from the private into the public. Okay, so that's this notice of understanding and intent and the claim of right, which is actually just, this is my understanding of the system, how it will work, so you can put that wherever you like there. This is my intention to live in peace and harmony with the planet and you know, live by natural laws. And the claim, my, my claims of right are here. I claim the right to, you know, travel without a driving license or whatever it is, whatever you want. So that's your own private law. Then it's how do you enforce that private law? Well, then you're going to have to follow the due process again, which means you have to get them to see your, your thing. And that's where we've really struggled, because actually they don't want to look at this stuff. They don't really want to. They try to avoid looking at it. And that's, um, they try all sorts of dirty tricks, really. Um, they're not very happy about it. So one of the things about this uh, due process is that what's supposed to happen is they have a claim but you've got your notice, or whatever it is you've put in for the court case, that's your claim, and this is a counter-argument. In other words, they have to judge your claim first before they can judge the other one. Mm -hmm. So if your claim is 10,000 million pounds yeah, worth of damages, okay, and you get, them, you get them to see that, and they get to say, yes, okay, we accept that. Now, whatever happens with these guys over here, you can always balance off the costs even if you lose, right? So actually, it's the scales of justice. It's like this. So you've just got to tip them in your balance and make sure there's more of a financial debt on your side. It gives you another layer to work with, right? So that's called a counterclaim. You know the proof of claim thing with the two signatures? Mm -hmm. um, if there was two places that you could sign yourself, could that be counted as two signatures? Or does it have to be two separate what, people? Oh, sorry, which one? The, the You said, the, um, I accept your blah on proof of claim. Yeah, and that needs two signatures on it. Yeah. No, no, that's just one. You can have one signature. That is, yeah, that's just one signature. So this is your truth. It's your an affidavit. That's what it is. 
What you're saying is, I swear that this is the truth. No, you were saying earlier on that the, the contract that you con- signed with Bank card. needs well, It's supposed two. to have two signatures, but it doesn't. Yeah, the credit card contract does not have two signatures on it. It's two right. separate signatures, two different signatures. That's right, yeah, two separate signatures. Yeah. Okay. One, in other words, one so from party A. in two different places, that's two still parties. Three. No, that's okay, cool. And the other thing is, you might notice a lot of it's placed in boxes when you sign. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was Yeah, and then, yeah, then yeah, that's irrelevant that yes. to the rest of it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, what, one interesting thing, when I, um, when I got my credit card, because I said, can I have the original contract? And they sent me a, a thing back. And what it was was the negotiable instrument. And they said it had been accepted by this house. Yeah. Accepted by issuer, they said, yeah. And then I thought, well, who's the issuer? And I realized, oh, it's me. I issued the credit. So they said, oh, accepted by issuer, accepted by me, the issuer. So that's all it was. They just had a stamp on it, and that was supposed to be the contract, but it wasn't a contract. It didn't have a non-signature. So what I'm saying is, is that contracts are verbal as well. So even when you're in the court, really, you're making con- you're contracting through your verbal. It's a trust agreement again. The judge is the trustee. Yeah. So now you're you're contracting. Any other questions about that? Silence. So we know how to do it now, eh? <laughs> okay, just before you go and stop paying all your credit cards, your mortgage, and all the other bills, right? Every say, it ain't going to be like an easy just walk in the park thing, yeah? But at the same time, also recognise it's a game. So actually, if you can, if you can live in the, in, the, in the game spirit and to keep the youth aware about it all, I think you do far better than sort of being too, you know, because it can, it can take you down, yeah? It can sort of really put a lot of pressure on it. But actually, I think it's getting easier and easier. I mean, if you know, um, if you want to know some more information, there's a website called debt, getourdebtfree.org, and that does basic stuff like credit cards. It doesn't do mortgages, but mortgages are a little bit more complicated yeah. because of the way it works. We're going to try and get the Get Our Debt guy uh, down next year in, uh, in the new year. So that cool. everyone's spent all the yeah. money on their credit cards. <laughs> and, uh, they've got, got their uh, debts up nice and high, then we're, we're sort of all out for everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, any other questions about any of that? Okay, yeah. Okay, I'll, 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 tell, shall I continue the story then? Of my yeah, 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 stuff? Yeah. Okay. So basically, what happened was after that, so I didn't get, I got ignored by the council, nothing really came of that. The next thing happened, I was, I was pushing this treason thing quite hard, and I, I learned quite a lot about legal service through doing that because I served, I served the four head commissioners of special branch with this evidence of treason, packaged it all up, and I sent it all off, yeah. Good like. Because the guy, when I was in the police station, the guy said, oh, we're going to start this special investigation report. And so they did that, gave me the special investigation number. So I was waiting for the respi- reply from special branch, and I hadn't heard anything. And then I sort of tried to, he said, if you haven't heard anything, email them. When I was looking on the website, I was like, I could not find special branch's email anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I what should I do? Okay, well, here's their address, and here are all the commissioners. So I sent all that off, right? And then basically, one of the guys actually wrote back to me. I couldn't believe it. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, but this, uh, this has nothing to do with uh, us. You have to deal with the local police. That's the people who would deal with that case. And what's quite interesting is that the local guy told me exactly the opposite and said, no, you've got to speak to special branch because we don't deal with that sort of case. So I wrote a letter back to him. Well, as you've opened it, I assume that you have read the contents, yeah? Because obviously, otherwise, you wouldn't know whether it was applicable to you or not. Let me just inform you, you know, obviously, that makes you involved in the whole plot because obviously you can see that treason is going on if you, if you look at what I'm saying, yeah? Because it's actually documented evidence about how they were trying to bring in Europe underneath all, all of the, you know, subversively, basically, and how they did. Uh, but you can look into that, it's Albert Burgess's work. Um, so then, basically, what, what they did was they, they'd sent the, the, the CD with this, this treason thing back to the original police officer, all right? So one day I'm sat at home, and I also get a knock at the door, and there's a special delivery, and it comes through the post. And I open it up, and, and it's like, it's my CD, and it's come back. But it hasn't come back to me from Special Branch. It's gone all the way back to this original police officer in Bristol. And then he sent it to me, Special Delivery. And what I noticed was, um, you know you get those little stickers? Mm-hmm. You know the little stickers? What I noticed was that he'd written a letter and stuck one of those stickers on the letter. Mm-hmm. Yeah? And what that did was that, that was what he was serving. He wasn't serving the evidence of treason. He didn't want that associated with it. He just stuck the sticker on that, that, front, that front page. So what I did after that was I realised... What we started doing was we started to, with our letters, if we were including lots of stuff, we'd put a notice of contents on the front and we'd stick the, 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 the registered post sticker on that. And then that would mean that this was legal, legally, now that's what you're sending. Do you know what I mean? That's, 
That's the deal. Yeah. Now this, all these things have been legally set. So you can't get out. Number or it could be, yeah. We could just say, I'd like you to notice the following content, but right. blah, blah, legally served yeah. to you on this date. And that's basically to that thing. So if you sign for it, you've delivered that. You've read. Yeah, yeah. And you can get you can get witnesses on the state the the contents thing. Yeah, yeah. witnesses on that. Yeah. That seals that seals the deal. Really, you can't argue that they didn't get it served. Yeah. Mind you, generally speaking, it hasn't been a major problem. Then, uh, sort of, oh, we've lost it in the post. They haven't been trying to get out of it yet. I, don't, I think mainly it's because we haven't really got to the state in this country where we're sort of making liquidations and things like that happen yet. But it's coming, so it's getting there. But yeah, if there's no monetary threat, threat that's, if there's a monetary <coughs> threat, that's when they try and push it all away and pretend they're not listening. Yeah? But we haven't really had that over here yet. So uh, any other questions on any of that stuff? Oh, yes. Liquidations, what liquidations? Ah, okay, what's a liquidation? No, no, what's a liquidation? What liquidation? Okay, so remember, you've, okay, we got as far as making this fee schedule, right? Yeah. So then the next thing is you know, you put an invoice in, right? <laughs> so what happens if you don't pay an invoice? You get start charging them interest and all that sort of stuff, and then you get you get someone else to buy it, to buy the debt and go and collect or something like that. Yeah. Now the problem has been like, I've got this instrument, would you go and buy it? It's, a, it's, a, it's only this police department or this judges. Yeah, it doesn't work, right? But that's why people have moved into what's known as these things called commercial liens. Yeah? Now, commercial liens are very, very powerful instruments. We won't talk about that too much. But what that does is that turns your... It's a way of making, actually, international monetary agreements. And now, because they've got a notary seal on, you can sell those internationally, you can trade them on stock, in, stock exchanges and things like that. And also, you can liquidate them, which means you can just register it into the public, yeah? and then they've got to pay all the tax on it. Otherwise, it's embezzlement of funds and things like that. There's all sorts of stuff you can do. But we haven't really, we haven't really hit the uh, monetary thing on the head yet. Although we've come pretty close. And they freaked. <laughs> they did freak out. So, let me, oh yeah, so basically, let me just take you back. So I did this, um, the, the special branch thing. That taught me about legal service, okay? Then after that, what happened was, I was driving quite peacefully down the road, or traveling in my conveyance, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hadn't actually sent off this, I've, I've been writing this claim of right and I had it all prepared, yeah, and then basically I got pulled by the police and then they arrested me. Uh, they found a little bit of blimp of marijuana and that was that. So arrested me, because I did the, uh, they said, is this you? I said, well, it's my legal fiction, you know, when they're looking at my driving license. Uh, so it's not actually me, but it's legal fiction. But he thought I was being clever. <laughs> well, maybe I was, or maybe he was just being stupid, I don't know. But either, <laughs> either one way or the other, we weren't, we weren't seeing eye to eye. And I've actually got the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the interview is actually quite funny, yeah? Like, what was, where does this vegetable matter come from, he said. And I said, the ground? <laughs> <laughs> A seed? Yeah. God? I don't know. You tell me. Depends on your religion and your faith. But, but anyway, they weren't, seeing, they weren't seeing eye to eye with me, so I actually ended up in the court, and then basically, when I went through a mad thing, trying to get my claim of right together, it really did spur me on to do all that. And I went in back, back in there with, my claim, with all this like, paperwork and all this sort of stuff, and basically got ignored again. And I was like, oh, right. So then they put an arrest warrant out for me, and then they arrested me. And then I went into the court again, and I was like, oh, so I, went, I went for this legal advice. I thought I would see what it was all about. So I went in there, and I got this legal advice thing going. I was like, okay, brilliant. What's, what's the score then? Like, well, were you complete guilty or not guilty? Well, which one? I said, well, to tell you the truth, I don't really feel I've had a fair shot at this, is what I said. So how, how, how can we roll, ba roll back the clock and get my stuff together? He said, oh, don't worry. We're just putting a no plea. Because he said, the judge is not going to look at all your paperwork. I've shown you my claim of right and everything like that. So um, we put in a no plea, which is what we said back there, wasn't it? And I was quite promptly uh, arrested, and the judge said, because I had to get a judge over from Bath for this, so, so he probably really pissed off. <laughs> so, so he said, right, this man will plea to me in Bath tomorrow. So I got locked up and then uh, spent the night in jail, where I learned lots about how the heroin trade works. It was brilliant. <laughs> Did they read you your rights when they locked you up in jail? Uh, not when they locked me up in jail, no, no. Are they um, supposed to? Uh, that's a good question. Well, are they right, supposed so under, to? Under, under caution, you're always under caution in the words of frequency. Yeah. Does understand it. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, they did. They, when I first got arrested, he tried to read me my rights, and I said, that's right, thank you very much. I've got my unalienable human rights, so I'll stick with those. I'll reserve them instead. And because actually, all they're doing is making an offer. Yeah. So I said, I thank you very much for your offer, but I already have these rights. Yeah. And if you spend so, the night in, in jail, yeah. are, are you entitled to legal advice? 
Are they supposed <laughs> to tell you that? You're, just, you're entitled to legal advice anyway, really. I mean, well, that's well, the if whole you point. don't know that, they're supposed to bring it to yeah. your attention, right or wrong? There, it depends, yeah. Basically, you're talking about your case particularly. I would say there's a case for that, yeah. That they should okay. have read, 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 if they've locked you up and done all that, they should read you your rights if you're being arrested, yeah. Yes. But the question is, am I being arrested? Did you arrest me? Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, so getting to say, admit yes, yeah. then actually, okay, well, you just did that wrong. You didn't follow due process. Yeah. Let's talk about the due process, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to create the contract, and that's what didn't happen in your case. They have no contract. So actually, all they've done is kidnapped you. You're right. So you can go, <laughs> you can go to kidnap. You can go and take them on the kidnap. Look at the statue there. <coughs> we'll see what the, the commercial lien. Each of those judges, yeah. Well, was it a judge who did it to you? It was uh, three. <laughs> the magistrates. Yeah, yeah magistrates. Yeah. That. I mean, yeah. If you can get their names and things like that, that's the other thing. Yeah? Or if not, you could put it to the court generally. It's like, yeah, because the court could pay them. Whatever it is, yeah. But um, yeah, it depends what's easier for you. I mean, you can go for them individually if you think they're particularly corrupt, and that's what you, know, you need to clear, yeah, up, they clear are. up the place. Because yeah. I know there's a couple of really corrupt ones there. So, uh, yeah, that's what you're saying. So basically, what I'm saying is you're, you're entitled to due process. If they didn't allow you to have due process, then actually they've made a mistake. And I had, a, for example, I had a friend who had, I think it was about 80 marijuana plants busted for that. And he put in a commercial lien for two and a half million against the police for stealing his property. <laughs> <laughs> beat them. We beat them in court, yeah, the starters, because they didn't follow due process. And then on top of that, walked out with a two and a half million pound commercial lien. Now, they really freaked out at that, yeah, they locked him up now, and they're trying to get him on terrorist charges. So I'm saying, sometimes, if you push them, they'll, they'll start to freak out, and they might do something, you know, quite untoward. You know, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, busted his other Uzi, yeah, you know. Yeah. But anyway, um, so the point is that they'll, they'll, they'll grasp at straws if you start to get success at this sort of stuff. Because yeah. there, there is nothing in the, in the, in, except a common law jury that can overturn a commercial lien. The judge can't do it. They can say it means I have to go to common law court, which they don't want to do. Because actually a lot of these things aren't to do with common law. Common law is about injury and loss. They can knock you off being mental. They do try the mental thing on quite a bit, yeah. Um, you know, uh, some people will, and more in the States, where this, because a lot of the commercial processes are a lot further advanced over there. Um, but a lot of the stuff that they've been doing out there, you know, because it's so dangerous to the court, they've tried to say, oh, they're mentally unstable, so they're not able to do that sort of thing. So they've actually gone and got their own independent psychiatric uh, sort of tests here that says they're sane. And said, actually, I've got this test here that says I'm sane, actually. That means that you must be the one who's. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've got my paper that says I'm right. So that must be you. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but it depends, I mean, how far you want to go then. But, um, but generally speaking, uh, you know, I, I, I'm at the stage now where I'd rather go from a kind of position of peace you know, rather than creating controversy. And so just go in there and try and settle the thing without you know, creating too much problems. You know? Because actually, in a way, it's not that they're evil or they're bad, they're just doing their job, do you know what I mean? But they just don't know what it is they're doing anymore. It's, it's, been, it's been watered down, hasn't it? They don't really know the law anymore. I mean, you could beat them in black letter law, which means all the statute law. You could beat them in common law, and you could beat them commercially easily. Because that's how powerful you are. There's, they're stuck in this one little thing. Now, quickly, if you ever see the judge, you ever see the judge get up and walk out and come back in, in a court case? That means that they're just changing jurisdiction again. Yeah? So that means actually they're trying to wipe the slate of everything that you said before. So watch out for that one, the little tricks. Uh, so there I was in uh, in prison. And I learned loads about the herring trade. And I, yeah, I did that, and I came out and I learned loads because actually, you know, if you go into the prison, one of the things they do they get to sign inside entry. Okay, this is not not, not like the cells downstairs. I'm talking about actually into the prison there because they had to keep me overnight in a cat. I was like, oh, dangerous screw. Quite honestly, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, and it was quite good as well because I got to tell those people about cream and stuff inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so basically, yeah, there, there's this whole kind of um, thing where you sign. Now, let me just explain what happens. Is remember I talked about the signature being a negotiable instrument. Mm -hmm. So when you sign to go into prison, what you're doing is you're signing over use of your bond. Whilst you're in prison, you're not allowed to use money, you're not allowed to do all this. It all goes through an account which is held by the prison officer. And actually all the stuff in prison is bought through the Argos catalogue. So yeah, as long as it's in the Argos catalogue, you can buy a prisoner anything you want from the Argos catalogue. So, uh, 
it's all like chipping and buying. So, so basically, what that means is you don't have access to your birth certificate bonds. You're not going to use your birth certificate bonds, so they can. So they start making loads of money off it, and that's what how that pays your debt. You pay back your debt in time. Whatever it is you've done, it's always a commercial crime. So I came out of um, I came out of the prison. Thing. Well, I got taken to the court, and once again, waiting around for ages. And then I was in the court. I went, I went for this legal advice again, yeah, and you could, the guy was just very happy. He's like, oh, don't worry, I can get you out of here straight away. Don't worry, don't worry about this. Oh, okay. And I was a bit sort of shaken up. I was supposed to be at work, you know, none of that happened, and a little bit, a bit of a shock, yeah. So I was a bit spun out, and so he's like, okay, what do I have to do? So plead guilty, and that's it, you're out. Like, Is that it? Yeah, okay. What I didn't realise was that two of my mates had bust into the court as witnesses. <laughs> right. And... What happened was when they did that was that this this shock came over the look the my, my the solicitor who was representing me the shock came over his face because all of a sudden what he'd realised is that they'd fucked up yeah and that I had witnesses now now if I had played it a little bit differently yeah if I'd known what I'd known now yeah maybe I could have got away with it a lot more so um, but why didn't yeah so I just I said there so how do you plead and I'm like oh god ah how do I plead oh is that good so I said oh I plead Guilty to the facts, yeah? <laughs> Which is, I, I said the facts being the uh, affidavit and everything like that, I put in. Um, one of the other interesting things I learned about doing all this as well is that the court has two sides. Do you know about this, the public and the private? So if you put a document into the court, it goes into the public side, and that's the clerk holds that, and that's a piece of paper he flips through. The judge doesn't see any of that. Not until you stand up and say, is there an affidavit in the file that says this or that. Yeah. So one of the things what they call is, um, in a way, it's like this process, right? So they say, oh, um, you have been charged under this statute. Yeah? So you've got these commercial liens. They're called uh, affidavits uh, of, um, sorry, yeah, they're called like um, aff affidavits of uh, commercial. Oh, what's this going to say? What are they? Commercial liens. Yes. So basically, you say, is there an affidavit of obligation? That's what it's called. Yeah. And what you say is, is there an affidavit of obligation in the file that requires me to be obliged by those statutes? And at that point, they're supposed to look in there and then find your affidavit of obligation, take it, look at it and say, oh no, it says here that you don't have to be obliged by those statutes, because that's the law now, in the case, right? That's the law in the case, you've got them, now you've got them to see it. That's always been a bit difficult, yeah? Um, it's called the merits of the case, that's the code word for it, the merits of the case. So once you can get them to look at the merits of the case, which is your affidavit, is there an affidavit they're requiring to that? No, there isn't. Okay. So you haven't, you haven't you know, denied it, you've asked them the question, is there this? Yeah. It's a different way around it. It's the master relationship. Uh, I don't know if that will, like I say, one of the major problems is, is that they don't know what they're doing. That's the, that's the major problem. We know more about all this stuff than they do. Everyone knows loads more about the paperwork, everything like this, yeah? more than they do. So that's the that's a problem, yeah, because you know, it's the dumbing down of the justice system. So you've got real problems. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. It isn't. It isn't. No, that's right. And that's why. That's why ultimately we need to you need to find the remedy. It looks like you know it's either commercial or we just hang out in the streets until they all stop. <laughs> um, one one of the things. Do you want to hear about the Birkenhead thing? Yes. Yeah. Well, they arrested the judge. They arrested the judge, basically. Does anyone, so that, just so you know the, the background on that, what it was is a council tax thing. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, by the way, if you want to start messing with your council tax, one thing you should do is realise, and I really reckon you should realise this, is that it's nothing to do with the bill. It's to do with the public notice they serve before the bill. And that's what you need to object to. It comes in just before April. What, in the newspaper? Yeah, we put it in the newspaper. That is what they call due process. Because yeah? now they've informed the public, we're going to charge this. Any objections? No. Then they'll start to release the bill. Right? So if you want to catch out the council tax, that's the place to do it. Yeah. Because if they haven't got that, they can't charge you. If you, if you well, put in, we put it in the paper, blah, blah, we followed this due process. And if you come back to it, well, here's my notice of response uh, to your notice in the paper that says no. <laughs> you know. At that point, they've got a problem because if they're supposed to get back to you and all this sort of stuff, right? Can you do the same with your representatives as well? You with know, your, like your members of parliament, say, for instance? Yeah, I mean, you can do. I mean, generally speaking, I, I just did it all through one 
contract with all of them. There's uh, a clause right. you could put in called um, notice to principal, is notice to agent, notice to agent is notice to principal, which means that anyone you serve, it covers the whole lot. So you don't have to serve oh, 10,000 of these things, you can just serve one person. So if you're going to, that's a, that's a kind of legal term, if you like, that you can use. So, any more questions about processes? I don't read the paper. Does that mean that the, the notice isn't legal? No, because basically what it's, it's assumed. It's public domain. Is it? Yeah, it's assumed. You just put it into public domain. Yeah. Remember, you can do the same. You can write public notice. And this, let me just explain. Anyone know about UCC? Anyone done any of that stuff? Uniform Commercial Code. Uniform Commercial Code. code. Yeah. Are we going too far? Yeah. We've only got a few minutes left. Few minutes is wrapping up. OK, well, let, let's just say, I'm going to say this. So basically, that was my experience with the claim of right, yeah? What, what I've noticed is they're in fear of it, yeah? That's what I've generally noticed. Doing all my processes, I think they are in fear. They, they will do everything they can not to look at that piece of paper. Everything they can. Uh, so that's really where we're at with that. The other thing I've been involved with, which is a little bit more detailed, which is something called commercial redemption, which is where we do something called accepted for value. Um, now, uh, Dave Starbuck, who was supposed to be here, uh, was in Jamaica. Is actually in Jamaica. <laughs> yeah. but actually, he actually did that with his electricity company, because uh, you know they send you the bill. Well, he, you know, the check at the bottom. That's a really a check. That is really a check. So what he did was he signed off the check and wrote the amounts in and signed it on the back. He wrote accepted for value, which means. On, well, you can write the whole thing accepted for value. It says de detach this and attach payment. So, so you fill out the check, then you write accepted for value on the, the main on the letter that they've sent you, saying I accept what you're saying, and as soon as it comes back into substance, we'll pay it all off. But until then, I just accept it for value because it's my only remedy, and you just staple it and send it back. So yeah, they were all like moaning at him for not paying his electricity bill in a year, and trying to get a, 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 a what is it, a warrant to get into his house to change the meter over. Yeah? So he turns up in court. And he uh, stands there and uh, basically he says, oh, we've got anyone, we've got anyone, oh yeah, this guy here is trying to contest. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, well, basically, uh, you know, he said, I'll pay it all, conditional acceptance, but I just want the original things I paid with sent back. If you're saying that's not the cash, I'll just send them back and I'll, I'll pay with whatever you, however you want. They can't do that because they'd already cashed, the reality is they've already cashed it. They just want to try and make a, what's called double dipping, yeah? so they charge you twice. That's why you repay your mortgage, because you've paid for it already, and you're going to pay for it again. And probably again as well, by the time they add the interest on. So, it's the worth, one of the things that's worth looking at is these, these kind of terminologies, about how you know, these words have double meanings, sometimes. And, um, but I want, what I kind of want to get to, if we're just going to round up, if that's all right. Actually, I did have a little story. Yeah, have you got yeah, time yeah, yeah, yeah. to do a little story? Uh, so it's actually a, a thing which I wrote for um, the kids, uh, which kind of... Uh, yeah, we've done that. Which kind we've of uh, might be a, might be a, just a good way just to wrap up this legal fiction stuff. My last point is this: before I read this, is actually it's nothing to do with the paperwork. All this paperwork is nothing to do with it. You can walk into a court without any paperwork and you can be very successful. I know people who've walked in there and just said, "I'm a free man in the land. I dis, I dis, I, I grant the court leave. <laughs> I grant the court leave." And they've they've had the court just get up and walk out. And that's it. So what I'm saying is sometimes, although you can get into the paperwork, it's nothing to do with that either. It's to do with how you feel inside. So let's have a little, little story here. Okay. <clears throat> so once upon a time, there was a king. Now this king was bad-tempered and horrible, and he went round like he owned the place. Um, he taxed people unfairly, killed and murdered innocent people, and never listened to anything that they said, anyone said to him. So one day, all the people in the land took him by the scruff of the neck and said to him, You're a bit of a horrible king. If you want to rule this country, you'd better do it with a bit more respect, or we'll cut off your... Okay. <laughs> now, the king didn't want to lose his... Can't whistle, sorry. Uh, as he needed them to make more kings and queens. And so he said, okay, okay, okay. I'll tell you what, how do you want me to rule you? So he said, well, we want you to protect our right to life, liberty, and property. They replied, as that was what God had said. Remember those commandments things? Yeah, that's what they were looking at. And they all knew that they had human rights as a creation of God, and that they would be given free, had that, and that they've been given free will. So they got the king to sign this agreement and to protect their <coughs> rights, and everyone was very happy. They could get on with, the, with their lives, enjoying the land that God had given them. Time passed until one day a small group of men became unhappy with what God had given them, and they decided they wanted more, more. They wanted the world, and so they opened a bank and became the world's first bankers. As time passed, 
Um, sorry. God looked down and came to them and said, Hey, uh, hey, do you want to... Uh, you can do what you want, right? But don't interfere with my God-given human rights, okay? And the bankers agreed. So they decided to invent a game. They started to gather up pieces of straw, and one by one they gradually shaped it into something that looked like a man. Or a woman. It depends on which your perspective is. A human, if you like. The straw man looked so much like the people of the land that they were amazed and sometimes confused when they looked upon it. Wow, they said. Is that a real man? Now, the bankers were very cunning, and they said to the people, Would you like to take this straw man home with you? If you would like, we'll name him after you. And if you do, we will give you benefits and privileges to make your lives better. Now, this made the people very happy as they felt safe and secure, and all was well. Again, time passed, and people forgot about the straw man that had been given to them. And there he sat in the shadows, gathering dust, waiting for his time. Now, a time came where one day there was a great war, and this cost a lot of money. And so the government had to borrow lots of money from the bankers in order to pay for it. Now, the government was not a human being, and it was not made of flesh and blood, and what's more, the bankers knew this. They decided to charge the government lots of interest on the loan, so much the government could never repay it. This meant that the government went bankrupt. This can't happen to us, they said. We're the government. Does the government have feelings? Does it work upon the land? Does it have human rights under God? And the, the government had to agree that it did not. But what are we to do, they said. Don't worry, said the bankers. I think we can come to some arrangement. And so they told the government about the straw man that was sat, in the dormant, uh, was, that sat dormant in the homes of each and every one of the people. What you must do is send a bill to every straw man in every house and ask them for money to help run the country. The people will see this bill and believe it is addressed to them. And, as they are good-natured and, and the bill is reasonable, then they will pay without question. Now the government was happy as now they could run the country for the king, and so were the bankers as now they could make, get more money from the government. Now the people, when they received their letter, were afraid of losing any uh, of, the privilege, of the privileges that they had gained. And so, um, and so they were, uh, were afraid that if they didn't pay, everyone would, everyone would look at them badly. And so they paid the bill, not knowing it was addressed to the straw man in their cupboard. That they had completely forgotten about all those years before. A few years passed and gradually the people got used to the idea of paying for their benefits and privileges. And the government and the bankers were happy because it made them lots of money. However, the government realised that they never got enough money to quite pay back the debt. And so the debt grew and grew. To keep up the repayments, the government was forced to charge the people more and more money, until one day the people had no money to give to the government. Don't worry, said the bankers. I think we can come to some arrangement. And so they told the people that they could borrow money from them if they wanted. How much can we borrow, said the people. Well, that depends on how good at making money you are, they replied. We have got lots of things for you to do to make money. That, that sounded, this sounded fair to the people, so they accepted and signed a piece of paper to say that was okay. Now, the bankers knew they could not charge the people with human rights, and so they continued to send bills to the straw man, who was in their house, sat in the shadows, gathering dust. The people had forgotten who they were, and so they thought the bill was intended for them. After all, they had signed an agreement with the bankers, right? OK. Years passed, and no one questioned anything. And then things started to get very bad throughout the kingdom. The people found that they could not afford their bills, and everyone started to be very unhappy. Don't worry, said the bankers. I think we can come to some arrangement. Just give us your land and your homes, and that will take care of the money owed. And so reluctantly, the people started to give up the land and their homes to the bankers. One day, there was a poor family, and in that family was a young man who could no longer afford to pay his bills and his debts. So he thought he was going to have to give up his house to the bankers. There he, there he was in the shadows, clearing out all of his old things, when he came across the straw man. The straw man looked just like him. The young man wondered where this object had come from. Sorry, nearly there. Are we all right for time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. All day the young man wondered about the straw man, and, 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 all, and late night he uh, fell asleep and had a very strange dream. He dreamt that he was, in the, he was looking for the straw man in the basement of a dark cellar. Carrying a torch, he crawled further and further into the cellar until he came to a door. He opened the door. Inside was the straw man, who turned to him slowly and said, Can I help you? The young man was afraid, but plucked up the courage to ask the straw man, I found you in the shadows, and I was wondering how you came to be. The straw man told him the whole story. He told him about the bad king, the God-given rights of the people. He told him about the bankers' plan to use the straw men everywhere to raise unfair taxes from the people. And when he had finished, the young man knew what he must do. The next day, the young man awoke to a knocking on the door. He got up and answered, 
and it was greeted by a banker. Good morning, young man, said the banker. I have a bill here for you which says you owe us more money than you can afford to pay. So I think we can come to some arrangement. Uh, for your house, for example, it will easily pay the bill. All you have to do is sign this piece of paper and we'll take care of all the rest. He handed the young man a contract and a pen. The young man looked at it and then remembered his dream. No, he said, I owe you nothing, as I am a man of flesh and blood and I have human rights. This enraged the banker and he shouted back, Who do you think you are? If you do not pay your bills, who will fix the roads? Who will provide you health care? What will happen to your benefits and privileges? For a moment, the young man was taken aback. He didn't want to upset anyone. However, he remembered his dream and so refused to sign the banker's papers. We will see you in court, said the banker and stormed off. Weeks passed and the young man received a letter summoning him to court. Everyone in the village had heard the story and some were very upset with the young man. Who do you think you are? If you don't pay your bills, who will fix the roads? Who will provide us with health care? That's my village very voice. Naughty boy. It's a very naughty boy. <laughs> what will happen to our benefits and privileges, they said. Others would not even talk to him and treated him like a common criminal. When the day finally arrived, a huge crowd had gathered in to watch the court case. The bankers were first to lay out their charges. They had all of the accounts, they had all of their figures. They had a team of the country's best lawyers. Their arguments seemed impenetrable. Then it was the young man's turn to take the stand. The judge leaned forward. Do you have anything to say for yourself? He said. The room was silent. The trembling young man took a deep breath and spoke. Your Honour, I am a man of flesh and blood and I have human rights. Perplexed, the judge called for lunch and took to his book of the law to find out the truth. After lunch, an even bigger crowd had come together from all around to hear the verdict from the judge. Silence fell across the room as the judge spoke. This is indeed a very interesting case, and I have had a long look at, and hard, at long, long hard look at the law, and now I have reached my verdict. Stillness filled the air. In this case, you have said to me that you are a man of flesh and blood. Is that right? The young man nodded. And you say you have human rights. Again, the young man nodded. Well, in that case, I declare that you do not need to pay the bankers any money, as there, as there is no way they can charge a man of flesh and blood. They only, they only have power over a straw man who does not bleed and has no feelings. You are free to go. The courtroom erupted with a commotion. Some people were jumping for joy. Others talked excitedly between themselves, while others still were completely flabbergasted. That, that includes the bankers, who were outraged. They were jumping up and down with rage. News travelled fast, and it wasn't long before the people throughout the kingdom discovered their straw man and begin to take, began to take their homes and lands back from the bankers. And soon the king heard of this and summoned all of the members of the, his government and all of the bankers together at the palace. What has been going on here? he proclaimed. It appears there has been some kind of foul play and trickery of my people. Who could explain this? The ministers and the bankers all looked sheepishly at one another as the king opened the country's book of accounts and studied them. Seeing what the bankers had done and how the minister had work, ministers had worked with them to try and trick the people out of their God-given rights, he immediately sacked his ministers and declared to the bankers, You have used devious methods to try and take away the rights of my people. You may no longer lend any more money to anyone, nor does anyone owe you any more money. But what are we to do, said the bankers? I think we can come to some arrangement, said the king. <laughs> A few years passed, and the kingdom returned to its peaceful ways, and the people prospered and were very happy. Everyone had found the freedom that was theirs by right, and now that that had... Now that they had remembered that who they were, they were very careful never to forget it again. Thank you very much.